Welcome to the 21st meeting in 2020 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, our first item today is for the Committee um, to the Scottish General Election Coronavirus Bill. And joining us remotely on our first panel, and welcome, uh, Andy Hunter of the Association of Electoral Administrators Scotland and Northern Ireland, Malcolm Burr, Electoral Management Board for Scotland, and Pete Wildman, Electoral Registration Committee, Scottish Assessors Association. Now, I'm afraid we're, as you'll know, um, quite limited for time today with four committees. So on that basis, uh, rather than um, rather than having an opening statements, we'll just move straight to questions, if that's all right. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for nodding. Um, anyway, um, so first question then, uh, Patrick Harvey, please. Question one on estimates. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to our witnesses. Um, you'll be aware of the uh, estimates of the likely uptake of postal voting uh, that uh, have been produced partly as a result of opinion polling, uh, although that was taken some time ago. And as we know, public attitudes toward the, um, the pandemic and, and likely behaviour changes uh, may be in flux. Can you tell us what you, um, what you think of the estimates of the likely uptake uh, up to somewhere in the region of high 30s or low 40 per cent. Uh, is that an accurate judgment or do we need to prepare for a, a higher level of postal voting? And does anyone like to come in first there, please? I'm not getting any pictures here. Oh, hi. Hi, Pete. Yep. But I think it... I, I think uh, it is very hard to predict what, what the public will do. I agree it is um, a set of plus, uh, public's attitudes to postal voting and the pandemic are changing. Um, at this stage, we're not seeing a significant increase. There is a slight increase in postal vote requests, but it is slight. But it, equally, we are a long way out from the election. And a lot, I think the public's mind maybe hasn't turned to the election. And if you look at uh, previous elections, the vast majority of applications come in just ahead of the deadline. Um, it is, uh, so I don't think we're really going to know until we get close to the election what, what the actual numbers are going to be. But I think we have to plan on the information we've got, which is the information provided by the Electoral Commission, um, and use that as the best estimate we've got at this point in time, and we'll work on that to ensure we've got consistent volumes. The appropriate approach is to plan for that estimate uh, rather than to plan for the possibility that it may, in fact, be an underestimate. We've seen, for example, in the US, where there's a substantial COVID denial movement, which doesn't exist in the same way here, very, very high levels of postal voting in some communities. Yeah, I think it's something we just have to keep under, under review as things move forward. And if further surveys are done, that will assist planning as well. Uh, any of the other witnesses want to um, contribute on this point? Malcolm Burr, have you got something to say? Thanks, Pete. Yes, thank, thank you, convener, and uh, thank you for the invitation to appear uh, today. I mean, as, as Mr Wildman has said, it is difficult to estimate, and the evidence of the by-elections, uh, limited though that is, is that postal voting has not increased significantly. I think as... as as always, uh, it is important what messaging uh, is given, uh, particularly from the new year, about the possibility, about the option for postal voting. But uh, certainly, the Electoral Management Board intends to provide, uh, by way of by way of directions agreed with the electoral registration officers, uh, to, to set a fairly high level of capacity uh, for postal voting um, in anticipation and in, in recognition of what is a very volatile situation. And if that level was reached by early demand increasing more than you anticipate, uh, the, the only response then would be simply to move the deadline even further forward and tell everybody else you're too late? Um, that, that could happen ultimately, but I think, I think we, would, we will follow very closely uh, following every communication on the possibility of postal voting. We can't encourage one method over another, but we can bring it to people's attention. 
uh, what effect that is having. And if we are seeing increases, uh, we can adjust accordingly. And the uh, final witness want to add anything? And, um, Andy, Andy Hunter. Anything you want to I, add? Uh, um, no, I don't think I've any um, particular to add to, to the points here. Yeah, just as, as Malcolm said, keep an eye on as the numbers go forward and keep the plan in. Uh, and how we can deal with that, as, as with information and uh, estimates uh, come to light. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, thanks, uh, Patrick. Neil Finlay. Sorry. Um, yeah. I, I asked this off the bill team when uh, when they were here. Um, you know, I, I don't think we could tolerate a situation where we just adjust the date, the cut off date, simply because the capacity is not there to deal with it. I mean, the capacity has to be there to deal with it. And my, my question really is, is there, a, is there a basic model that says that the more money you put in to invest in um, setting up the systems to cope with postal voting, then the more ability you will have to cope with what comes. Um, it's a budget decision, this, isn't it, about maximising the, uh, the take-up of postal votes? Anyone? Anything you'd like to say? Uh, yeah, Malcolm. Malcolm Burr. Thank, thank you, Convener. It's not just, of course, about the number of applications. It's about when they come. Um, and that... We, the resource, you're absolutely right, has to be there. And, and we intend to provide for 40% uh, of the electorate uh, being able to vote by post. But, of course, it is critical that, uh, as far as possible, the spread of applications takes place over the longest possible time. Uh, undoubtedly, being realistic, a very large volume, very late, undoubtedly could overwhelm the system. But that, that is why the polling that has been done by the Electoral Commission, and certainly we will encourage as a board that that is done again uh, at a suitable time, uh, that the messaging is consistent. Uh, people are used to doing things in a different way. Um, I think it is it's reasonably foreseeable that that, the in, that that any increase in applications for postal voting it will come on a more systematic basis than than in previous elections. But certainly, we intend to make provision and insist on resource uh, for, for for around 40% of the electorate uh, to have the capacity to vote by post. Could, yeah. could I, I mean, I, I think. 40% is an underestimate. Once the political parties get involved in um, aggressively uh, marketing postal votes, I think you're an underestimate. I, you know, I, if I am wrong, I will absolutely uh, take that. But I'm putting on the record just now, I think um, uh, estimating for 40%, uh, you will have to revise that. Can I ask Malcolm, is there, is that, there a capacity that's... for that then, basically? Well, that's, it's possible we may have to, of course. That, that is based on the polling that has been done. Uh, we will also look at the evidence of the by-elections. Uh, and I think uh, additional polling of the electorate uh, in the new year particularly uh, will be essential to, to, to keep our estimates uh, as, as, as good as they can be. Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Um, John Scott? Um, thank you. Um, I, M Malcolm, if the capacity is around 40 per cent. What happens if you get um, a 50 per cent postal vote application? Do we have to, where do we go from there? Well, the direction, will, the direction, and that, that will be worked out with electoral registration officers, will be to allow uh, capacity for a, around 40 per cent of the electorate. That's, that's the estimate we're working to just now. Uh, we will, of course, between now uh, and then build in uh, as much capacity as we can based on the evidence that, that we have. But um, we, we are working, we are working as, as we all know, in a very volatile situation, trying to take appropriate polling information uh, at the time and also looking at the evidence of those elections which have taken place. Admittedly, these are local government by-elections. Turnout is not traditionally uh, terribly high, and that has been maintained. We haven't seen an increase, uh, a significant increase in postal vote applications for these by-elections, but we're not uh, we're not basing our estimates on that. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, 
Okay, and um, could I ask Jamie Halcrow Johnson uh, on issues of sufficient time? Uh, uh, for this? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. I mean, I think quite a lot of the issues that I was going to cover have been covered already, and I would agree with some of the concerns that colleagues have. Can I ask? I mean, if you are if you are looking at um, uh, if you are looking at forty percent at the moment, have you d have you done modelling for higher than forty percent? Uh, is there modelling for exactly you know what? Um, you know, say if there was 42 or 45, and what impact that might have on delays, depending obviously on when they ca on those applications came in. I uh, think Pete, uh, you got something? It is. Come in. It is very much when the applications come in. So uh, a steady flow of applications is a lot easier to manage and scale up. It is the the last few few days, which is probably the key point. We can scale up and train so far. Um, it's important that we've got enough staff to actually supervise. We, we are looking to take on extra people, improve, our, in, increase our capacity, as Malcolm said, working on 40%. The chance that we could probably do a bit more, but you, we can't, you know, it is very much when it comes in and how it comes in. Um, but we, as Malcolm says, we will keep it under review. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that other members of the panel may want to come in on that, but. But realistically, we're trying to look at the provisions that we're going to set out or that are going to be set out in this bill. Um, you know, we're trying to get an idea of what's likely to happen. And I think there is a feeling that, that, um, that there will be an increase. I mean, I, I don't think anybody at the moment is particularly focused on, uh, focused on, on, on the election, but they will be when it becomes, um, you know, when, it, when it's, you know, a few months away. So, you know, the idea that, that, we, that what, what I basically want to get an idea of is, is what you know, what will happen if, for example, in the last two months before the election, there is a push by the political parties, there is a response from the public, and, for example, that goes up to 42% or 45%. How will that be accommodated? And if it can't be accommodated within the existing timescales of the election, how will that be reported um, to ministers and to Parliament, I suppose? And what, you know, what, what would be the suggestion there? Would there then need to be a delay, and what delay would be would be likely. Anyone uh, like to come in there? Uh, Andy, Andy Hunter, would you, um, on the basis of uh, electoral administrators, how you, you would find that? Um, obviously, the, this is a highly pressured time for, for uh, the teams going forward, and um, if capacity was to go way beyond what was probably predicted, so not just a few percent over the 40, but if you're talking into the 50s and high 50s, then then there's extreme difficulty getting enough uh, enough time for the, the teams to, to be able to do that uh, properly. Uh, and as as uh, Pete was saying, the the capacity does have reach a peak point where there's only so many people that are trained and you know so many supervisors and only yeah you can add resources and throw more bodies there, but um, that those have got to be controlled and managed. That's where the difficulty comes in expanding it um, at the last minute. Um, so I think that's it. Then does become a problem if there's really does spike. So if it's a low level and then peak, so I think that's where we need to, to try and preempt that as best we can by uh, early early promotion. And if if they are going to promote or our parties are going to promote postal voting, then the earlier that's done, so that that isn't a spike, it's more of a increased curve. Um, will we'll benefit everybody to be able to cope with that that late stage. Jamie again. Um, okay. Well, th 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 thanks for that. I mean, just just a, what, one more qu quick question. Uh, Scottish ministers have the power to make regulations to move the postal vote voter deadline closer to polling day. Um, is that something that you support um, uh, w within the bill? And under what circumstances might that be uh, required, in your view? Hi. Anyone wishing to come in? Picture. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Aye, Andy, is that? Uh, I'm not quite sure because the picture disappeared. I didn't know if anyone was volunteering to have a, a word on that question there. Uh, Malcolm, would you be? Thank you, um, th th thank you convener. I, I, was, I was just going to cover the first point that uh, Mr. Halcrow Johnson ah, right. made. Um, that, just to reassure that the, the Electoral Management Board will. Uh, anticipate in anticipation of whatever increase the, the research shows and our own experience shows will 
um, work with government to put in place capacity to allow uh, whatever reasonably estimated volume of postal vote applications we have to be to be put through. Uh, as as has been as has been said many times, it is a question of timing uh, as well. If there is a if there is a late surge following a late change in coronavirus conditions, for example, that undoubtedly it uh, could be a problem. But we are monitoring this on a weekly basis uh, with electoral commission colleagues and the access they have to public information, together with an appropriate communications campaign. In an atmosphere, I think, in which the public is used to doing things differently, uh, we, we hope we can. Um, we, we will have the directions in place which should allow uh, applications to be processed. Thank you for that. And uh, I think the second question was about the, bringing the date forward. Oh yes, is, I... uh, maybe maybe Peter Weldman would be best best place to to deal with that. Hi, Pete. We have asked that the, uh, the the date suggested in the bill of uh, 21 days before, which is the 6th of April, allow sufficient contingency um, for based on the based on the 40 percent. So we could handle if up to 15 percent of the electorate applying in the last two weeks. Um, that allows us time to process it before the uh, files have to go to the printers and get the ballot papers out. Um, were you to move that date closer to the election, you, you reduce that contingency, and there is a risk that um, postal vote packs may not be dispatched in time for electors to return them, um, which is not a situation any of us would want to be in. So the, the 6th of April is there to, to allow contingency um, in the system for a large spike at the end. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Just very briefly um, to clarify something that I think Andy Hunter first talked about and then, and then others. The capacity constraint appears to be very clearly now on time and staffing capacity to undertake the registration process for postal voting, not on the procurement of postal voting packs themselves. Earlier in the discussion, uh, you know, before the bill was introduced, there was more of a sense that there might be a limit on how many postal voting packs could be procured at all. Is it the, now the case clearly that that could go beyond 40% uh, so long as the registration process works and that it's the registration process that is, the, is where the ceiling is, is coming from? Is that correct? Andy Hunter? Yeah, um, I would say that, yeah, because I think that there's capacity to print uh, much more packs. The printers can cope with that. OK. Um, it's getting them the information to be able to print that that, that could potentially be the problem if there's a spike at the end. OK, thank you. I saw others nodding, so I think that's that's fine. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that, Patrick, and thanks, everyone. Um, OK, I think uh, we should maybe move on to the all-postal vote um, election. And uh, uh, Maureen Watts, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just before I go on to the all postal vote, um, I'm really quite surprised that you haven't looked, since this is such an important issue, at the postal votes in in recent by-elections. Um, there was one in my constituency in Kincorthnig and Cove, and I checked last night, and the postal ballots uh, were roughly 2,000, and at the um, actual people voting in the polling station. 1,400. Now, by my collect calculation, that's nearly 60%, 58%. Now, it might be out a bit. Don't quote me on the exact... That's not the exact figures. Um, but, you know, and that was a turnout which was quite normal for, for by-elections, around 27%, I think. So um, I think that we are heading for very many more than you are seeming uh, to suggest. Um, but in terms of all postal ballots, you said that you reckon it would not be deliverable until 2021. Is that correct? I don't know who it was that said that, but um, uh, Pete. Well, is that is that the view of of the panel? I think the the exercise that needs to be undertaken is you have to get people to return an absent vote application form with their signature and date of birth. Um, at the moment, you're sitting at the electorate of about 17, 18% of the electorate with uh, those 
signatures and dates of birth in place. We would have to communicate with the remainder of the electorate, which is about 3.4 million, and get them to return forms. That is a, a process that has to take. It depends on the engagement, uh, how quickly the public engage with that process. So, from this point, at this point in time, yes, it would take um, over six months to deliver that. Malcolm Bor. As has made all the points, uh, it would certainly necessitate a delay of a minimum of six months uh, for the reasons that have been given. Thank you. Maureen. The idea of a delay, are you basing that on your current capacity? Have you had any consultation with uh, Solace or COSLA in terms of increasing your capacity? I mean, we have seen people moved into completely different jobs during this pa ca pandemic. Are you basing that on your existing capacity? And how, by how much would you have to increase your capacity um, if you wanted to meet the possibility of 60%, let's say, um, postal voting? Malcolm Bott. Yep. That's the, I think that is, that is the reason for, for the six months. I mean, we are looking at increasing capacity significantly for the reasonably anticipated increase in, in ordinary postal vote applications, if I can put it, put it that way, uh, without an all postal. But it's not all about capacity. It's about, uh, it's about the publicity. It's about the administration. It's about assisting voters who were not used to voting by post uh, to do that effectively, to make a proper application, uh, and then uh, to take to, to take them through that that voting process, which is which is quite different if you're not uh, if you're not used to it. Um, so there's, it's not simply about uh, raising the capacity, but that is why uh, that is why the, the the electoral management board estimates that there would be a minimum of six months uh, required, but that would still be in 2021. Uh, potentially, I should add, um, but that's uh, that's our estimate. It's, but it's not just about uh, increasing the capacity for processing. There's a lot of education and support uh, for people as well, which would have to be taken into account. Maureen? The date of November 2021 is obviously uh, mentioned. Would you support? If it was called, you know, with being duly consulted, an all postal ballot in November 2021. Well, I think an all postal election um, is very much a measure of last resort. Um, I think there are there are issues about, uh, and I'm sure the electoral the, the electoral commission as regulator will talk about the robustness of the register. Uh, there are the issues I've talked about. There is potential, uh, inevitably, um, potential disenfranchisement of a of a, of a number of a percentage of the electorate. It's a, it's not it's not uh, the way things are normally done. But if it has to be done, of course, uh, it is right. And and the electoral management board has been clear from the start that there needs to be a legislative provision for this to happen if it's required. Um, November, I think, yes, would be the, would be the absolute uh, earliest uh, time. I mean, I'm saying six months as a minimum. Of course, it all depends six months of which decision, um, and that's that, that's the question. But uh, that's a question for others uh, to determine. But yes, it is, it is right. The provision is there, uh, but I, I think it's it's unlikely uh, that, that 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 is. That that will be used, and it's certainly not the best option. Do you have any concerns about have any concerns? about fraud in an all postal uh, election, and are there any state steps that can be taken to mitigate that? I think it's it, again we're back to the uh, we're back to the reason for the six months. We wish to do this uh, properly. We wish to do this on the same basis as every other. Postal vote, and that uh, that will minimise uh, absolutely the possibility of fraud. We've been fortunate in Scotland to have um, very, very, very few uh, instances uh, of even investigation of electoral fraud, and by by 
conducting an all postal uh, election on the same basis as we process other postal votes, um, I, I don't have concerns on that front. Just one. Very quickly, Maureen, thanks. Um, yes, have you had any discussions with Royal Mail in relation to po possible postal delays and postal delays perhaps due to further lockdowns? Uh, yes, yes, we have, and that's uh, that's always a concern. Uh, we have we have issued we have did discussions with Royal Mail before and after each electoral event, and uh, they too would have to commit the necessary resource to making that work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, now we've got um, four people who would like to ask very short questions, just to follow on here. The first one's Gil, please. In theory, if uh, the government decided or the parliament decided to have an all postal ballot in May, so what you're saying is it's, you could uh, you could use your six months from now and deliver that, or six month ish, or are you saying that we need to wait six months before we can even consider it? I'm not clear on that one. Sorry, I think uh, thanks, uh, Gil. Pete Wildman, you were animated. Yeah, I. I think from, to deliver from six months from now is not is not feasible. Um, you, you, we're at a low base in terms of the number of electors we're registered for a postal vote. I think when you get to May next year, how deliverable, uh, how quickly something could be delivered will very much depend on what level of postal vote registration we've reached at that point. So if you're at, if we get to May and we're at 50 or 60 percent of the electorate with a postal vote and all postal vote all postal later in the year. Uh, is a possibility. If it remained at this level, then that would be would be challenging. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, we've got John, Neil, and Jamie. Uh, John, Scott, please. Um, thank you very much, um, Bill. Um, at section five, um, at the moment, it's uh, a postal, all postal vote uh, would be at the discretion entirely of Scottish ministers, um, and after consulting with the presiding officer. And uh, would you agree with me that this section uh, needs to be strengthened um, in as much as perhaps uh, should the Electoral Commission recommend that this happens? Um, should it be rather than consulting with the presiding officer, uh, should it be with the consent of the presiding officer? Um, should it be uh, something that MSPs vote on? Or should it be perhaps under the affirmative procedure? But at the moment, it appears to be entirely at the discretion of the Scottish minister, which Scottish ministers, which um, seems uh, odd to me. Anyone like to take that on at all? Uh, Malcolm, I think. I think these are largely political matters, but. Um, I'm pleased. I'm pleased to see uh, that the consultation is is obviously with the Commission as regulator, with the Electoral Management Board representing practitioners. I think that's advice Scottish ministers uh, should and indeed do wish to have. Thank you very much for that. Um, you might like to bring that up again later on, John. Thank you, uh, Neil. Please. Just a quick point. The uh, an issue that's been flagged up to me has been the. Um, enfranchisement or disenfranchisement of uh, service personnel. Um, given the uh, timescale for the turnaround of ballots um, and the disruption to postal services in some far-flung places, then uh, there's a concern that the turnaround time is not long enough for service personnel. I wonder if you could um, consider that and maybe look at extending that. Anyone like to take that? Yep. Uh, uh, Pete, please. Personnel are entitled to register for an absent vote now, and I would encourage them to do so, um, and to make sure they're registered as a service selector and to get their absent vote application in. That would mean if they've applied for a postal vote, their postal vote will be in the first issue of postal votes, which gives them the maximum possible time to complete and return their ballot ahead of the election. That's not the point I was making. What I'm saying is that if they apply at any point, then given the uh, the nature of uh, 
postal services, how do we ensure that they are enfranchised if there are issues with postal services overseas? Apply now. If they apply now, it's fine, but if they apply later, then it might not be fine. I think that's one of the reasons for bringing the application date forward so that people, it maximises that time uh, for uh, these things to be issued and for the postal vote packs to be uh, sent out. Thank you for that. Thanks. And Jamie, please. It's just just a quick, and I just just to kind of echo the points of, of John Scott made. I would agree with that. It's a concern I have, but I, I wanted to ask a more practical question. I mean, obviously, if we're talking about an all postal ballot, it'll be because it'll be likely because there is a uh, another spike, or um, we're in a situation that we we didn't want to find ourselves in in terms of the virus. How are your um, how are your staff who are obviously processing these postal votes? How are they? Uh, sorry, these um, postal applications. How are they? Uh, impacted by restrictions, um, what pressure uh, pressure does that put on them? Are they able to go into work and do that? So, uh, and I take it that's all being considered in in your um, in your kind of modelling of timescales. Hi, I think uh, Pete, you on that? Yep, Pete Boyman. At the moment, time uh, electoral registration offices are operating a blended uh, model with the vast majority of staff working from home and with uh, a few staff in the office opening and processing it. Um, we keep that model going forwards. We will up the number of people in the office to actually open and scan the mail. Um, some EROs will use remote scanning services to actually do that work for them. Um, but we would operate it in a contingency so people working at home and people working in the office, which mitigates the risk of the impact on COVID. So uh, were uh, an issue to arise and staff had to self-isolate, operations could still continue um, from home. So that is the model we're looking at. Okay. Well, thank you very much you. for that. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got a couple more uh, elements to go through this morning with this panel. Um, I've done not bad for time, but we'll keep our eye on time. Um, okay, polling on additional days in the count. Uh, could we have Gil to open on that, please? Yes, very much, uh, Convener. Hey, the bill does not provide certainty about multiple day polling. Is this a cause for concern and at what point must the decision be taken on this to allow you to arrange suitable polling places and staffing etc Hi. Uh, Malcolm Malcolm Burr Yes the, the decision should be taken as early as possible of course uh, convener but I, I think it's recognised that we're in a a situation which changes week by week and I would certainly say that decisions should not be taken any earlier than they have to be but when they when they do have to be taken uh, they need to be taken quickly and that's that's perhaps um, the good part of all this we have had a very good uh, working relationship as a board with civil service with ministers uh, and they have shown themselves willing to uh, accommodate what the, the advice that is being given by uh, practitioners and by and by the regulators. So I'm confident that although it is not on the face of the bill, uh, and of course that that would that would be uh, that would be the most certain position. We're not in a we're not in a particularly uh, certain environment just now. And provided that uh, decisions are taken when they need to be taken, I think we're. Uh, I, I'm certainly um, content with with what's with what's on the face of the bill at present, but uh, certainty uh, is always is, is is important in elections. And of course, there are a lot of administrative processes, poll cards, communications to voters, booking of venues, staffing. All of these matters are essential for electoral administrators. So. Uh, all I would say there is that we, we would look for a commitment that when decisions are required uh, on advice, these are taken quickly. Uh, and if it is multiple, <laughs> and if it is multiple days, uh, there's two aspects to that. So there's a public one, and then there's the administrative one uh, that, that would concern yourselves. Is there a benefit in having if this, if it transpires, it's multiple days? Should they be consecutive? Uh, or if if they're not consecutive, does that provide a difficulty for you? I think it would provide a difficulty for the public, but how would it be for you? 
Yes, I think consecutive. Uh, Andy, to come in after then, please. Thank you. Yeah, right, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, consecutive would be greatly to be preferred, and you know we, we must we must remember that we have we're running by elections uh, in at present in a safe environment. Polling places will be safe. They will be safe. They will be regulated environments. I would I would argue. Uh, even perhaps in a level four area, a polling place would be uh, a significantly safer environment than, say, a supermarket. So we have to we have to remember that, 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 that there is no bar to, to physical voting, uh, provided polling stations are appropriately uh, run. And of course, getting back to the earlier discussion on postal voting, uh, we will have an estimate of how many voters uh, are likely to be using polling stations. So. Consecutive days, I think, essential. I, I at the moment, uh, the board is not envisaging uh, any greater number of days than two. So, um, so just simply to spread out numbers, but much will depend, of course, on the the uptake of postal voting as well. Uh, Sorry, that was a long answer. I hope that's helpful. And could we just have Andy as uh, thanks for Gil there, Andy, the administrator's uh, side of things for that question. Yeah, I mean, um, it's always good to have, as Malcolm said, a fixed point, so you know what that decision early, so you can plan and prepare for that. Um, I think it's key that, as I say, it's consulted on so that we know when that happens, that we can move very, very quickly to, to, to the options. But obviously, depending on when that is, there's, there's various impacts. I mean, like Malcolm said, with the poll cards, and information is already gone out when polls are open, and all these things impact how we would deal with changes to the number of days. Um, but yeah, as, as I think it's right, we can move quickly, and we know um, if that decision has been made that we can then put the steps into place uh, uh, rapidly to, to make that easier for the for the administrators to, to make sure they deliver uh, what's required. Go. Well, that is useful because I'm sure that the public would be very confused if it had been if there had been split days. So that 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 makes sense. So that's good. It doesn't cause you a problem. Uh, can I raise another matter? Ministers would have the powers to specify that certain categories of elect uh, electors may vote on specific days or times. That seems uh, like it's, it's likely to create a real challenge uh, administratively to ensure that people were clear on when they could vote. Do you have any concerns about this provision and what it means to you, 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 your people, uh, your, your employees in practice? How, how can you manage it? Andy? I think um, having um, a non-consistent where certain categories can vote on certain days is, is not, a, not necessarily a good idea at all. Because um, you see a clear, nice, clear message to say the poll is open from then till then, uh, makes it easier for for the voters, uh, saves confusion. Then, because you get in the difficulty of to turn up in the wrong slot, and how do you deal with that, and how the staff have to deal with that, uh, makes things way more complicated than any benefits it probably brings. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, there's one confusing bit in my mind that uh, there is a pattern develops in voting day that uh, working people vote in the morning before they go to work. Mums and mums and take their kids to school and vote. Then pensioners come out about 10.30 till about 4.30. So there's a rhythm to, a, to, a, to, a, to the general population. Uh, and workers come back out, of course, uh, as they finish their work. So if we were going to put in a false definition like age, you, you know, at a certain time, that, that could just upset the apple cart rather than help the situation, in my view. I wonder if you would make comment on that. Andy, are you? Yeah, yeah no, I think you, you're right. The, um, the public will the, the generally make their own patterns, um, and I think um, the patterns will develop, and patterns probably are slightly different now in the environment we live in. Compared to previous uh, elections, uh, people are working more from home and things, so that will impact how they normally, as you say, normally workers would go before or after work. They might not be able to. They might be able to do that during the day now because they're local anyway. So the patterns might naturally change, um, and I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily a good idea to try and preempt what that pattern might be. Okay, um, thanks. By fixing it by certain practices. 
Yeah, thanks very much for that. That's yeah, fine. Thanks, boy. thanks, Gil. Thanks, Andy. Um, okay, I think um, we can look at additional challenges such as uh, delaying the vote, parameters for decision making around de delaying the vote. Um, John Scott, please. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, just to finish off where Gill um, was a minute ago, um, I mean, given the, the difficulties of holding the election over two days, is it still your preference to hold the election over one day, or is, it, is your preference two days to be clear-cut about it? Uh, Malcolm Burr, please. Uh, the, the, preference, uh, the preference would always be for one day. Thanks very much. Um, my questions are, uh, in administrative terms, what are the key factors which would influence whether the poll could go ahead? What are the key points in time for making those assessments? Uh, what is the cost in delaying a poll and who would cover these? That's for starters. Yep. Um, and uh, Pete Wildman? Um, I think that's probably more a question for, for Malcolm than, than myself. Uh, I think Malcolm's probably better placed. Sure. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm, please. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. Um, I would refer to my earlier remarks about um, polling being possible even in a level four lockdown because um, it's a highly regulated environment. People will not... Uh, they will be welcomed, of course, when they come to vote, but they won't be encouraged to linger. So they won't be there for more than the 15 minutes that would trigger uh, contact tracing. Um, the board appreciates, of course, that while polling may be possible uh, during a level four lockdown, uh, it may not be desirable because in inevitably there will be some dis discouragement of people to, um, to, to vote. Some people may feel that's not an essential activity, although, of course, uh, voting could absolutely be regarded uh, as an essential activity. But there may be, there may be concerns uh, about turnout. And if these changes come late in the day, uh, for example, after the, after the last date of application for postal voting, then we appreciate, of course, that decisions may have to be, that may reasonably be taken to postpone, uh, to postpone the election for such time as can as, as can reasonably be anticipated in this volatile uh, situation, and that's um, the the last thing anybody wants here is, of course, to have any questions over the legitimacy of the poll. But um, and of course, this is a national election. Uh, as we all know, uh, restrictions can be different in different parts of the country, uh, and that also has to be taken into account. But delaying the poll, we would suggest that some areas and not others would not support a consistent national contest and would give, would give rise to difficulties, obviously, if results were available in some areas and not in others. That's, a very, that's not a route down which I think we should go. Absolutely. Point taken. Absolutely. Point taken. So, so what plans are in place in the event that a key figure, such as a deputy returning officer, has to self-isolate? on the day of or close to a poll, for example? We, we, have, we, have, uh, as we have robust deputising arrangements uh, for both the returning officer uh, and the deputy. OK, thank you. And the, the, the de deputy returning officers would be assisted by their election officers or, or election managers or equivalent, or equivalent staff, and we will, we will make provision for that. Uh, thank you. And we just want to check, are you facing any challenges around securing uh, polling stations which are suitable in terms of space for social distancing, the need for good ventilation, etc.? Are you confident that enough polling and count staff will be available to allow for the smooth running of the poll? And what contingency plans do you have around this? That, these are these are very important questions because not all polling places will be suitable. I'm sure uh, we have been a lot of a number of by-elections, several by-elections across Scotland in, in urban areas, in rural areas, in island areas, and so far, uh, finding venues suitable venues has not has not been an issue. That uh, 
returning officers are making contingency plans and looking at venues uh, on the basis of the current regulations. Staffing issues, of course, much depends on the local situation. Um, and certainly in the by-elections we have seen, we have had at least one additional member of staff to guide voters through the uh, through the the health pro the health part of the process, if I can put it that way, and just to explain, uh, you know, why why things are, are slightly different and a bit more regimented, and we would certainly look to have at least one additional member of staff uh, at each at each polling place or station. Uh, at the moment, uh, there have been no difficulties in recruiting staff, whether in level three, level two, level one areas. Uh, but it's but we will provide for contingency in that probably I imagine from the local authority staff uh, who support the elections in any case. Thank you. Sorry, um, I missed, did I, I hope I answered all of your points there. I may have missed one out. I think you're fine. Thank you. Um, finally, the bill is unclear on whether and in what circumstances uh, would the convener of the EMB and others be consulted and what those consultation requirements would involve and whether the views of the respondents would be weighed, weighted and, and whether your views would be made public. Maybe you'd like to discuss that and what your expectations in that regard are. Um, I certainly would have no personal objection to my advice being being known. Uh, that's that that would, it would be based on it would be based, I hope, on objective objective criteria along the lines uh, that I've mentioned today. So uh, I would have no personal objection to the advice being made being made public. But I suppose it's a matter it's a matter for ministers and and the parliament in considering this bill. Uh, the bill is unclear on, on, on the circumstances in which you, you would be consulted. Do you have any views on that, on which uh, circumstances you would expect to be consulted on? Well, the, the bill currently provides for, for the, the, the Electoral Management Board and the convener to be consulted on the all-postal vote, um, on the additional days and on, uh, and on postponing uh, postponing the election, so um, I'm, I, would ex I, would, I would I would expect the electoral management board representing practitioners to be consulted uh, on these matters, and that provision uh, does appear to be in the bill. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for it. Thank you, John. Thanks, Malcolm and uh, Jamie Halker Johnson. Do you have something? Uh, thanks very much. Actually, just two 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 quick quick words. Um, there have obviously been by-elections postponed, um, and sometimes in urban, as in rural areas. Um, now I know that's a decision for the local authorities, but um, you know, obviously, Malcolm, you suggested polling stations will be would be able to operate in level four, but in some cases, in uh, in, in areas even where there are low um, low counts uh, of uh, cases of coronavirus, councils have made the decision not to run. So I was just wondering, um, uh, I was just basically looking at kind of you know why why two day polling particularly in those areas might might be important and also you know i suppose why why some councils are um uh, you know not going ahead with or suspending um by elections yes the, these are these are individual these are in, these are questions for individual returning officers and and they take their they take their um, assessment locally. They do consult with the board, and it's fair to say I have been I have been encouraging returning officers to go ahead with by-elections uh, wherever they consider it safe and appropriate to do so. Now, and, and most uh, most of the scheduled by-elections have uh, have indeed gone ahead, uh, and, and as you've said, in, in a variety of settings, urban, rural. Island, and these have all been. Con we have conducted a review after each of these. The board meets tomorrow, and will consider a further report on the conduct of by-elections. And none of these have raised any uh, grounds of public health concern, uh, quite apart from electoral issues. Um, so, my, my my advice to returning officers is, wherever possible, uh, to proceed with scheduled by-elections. 
just just one other connected issue. Um, we've not talked about the count, uh, and I was just wondering what concerns or what issues you see in terms of the count, given there is a considerable sharing of um, ballot papers during the counting process, um, you know, close inspection of ballots needed, that kind of thing. If there are any particular issues that, that might come up there? Yes, I think I think the the, the counts uh, that's that's an important point. I think the the count in any kind of coronavirus regulated environment will will take longer. Uh, it is it is that there is there is more space required. Uh, there is more ground to cover. Uh, the circumstances in which, for example, doubtful ballot papers have to be shown to uh, the candidates and agents has to take place in a more regulated and distant environment. Um, it's, it's, it's just more cumbersome, and, and it will therefore take longer. Uh, it, 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 it will also take, I think, uh, greater numbers of staff, because if we cannot group large numbers of count staff around a table, as is not possible at the moment, then the supervision, uh, the numbers of supervisors have to be increased, perhaps the number of uh, deputy returning officers on the night. It, it is just more, more cumbersome and, and therefore slower. And just uh, it's the same process. And it's the same process, just more complicated. Uh, it just, just, just in terms of say, in a in the worst case scenario, there was a a, a delay to some ballots being able to be counted for whatever reason. Um, it could be. Is there a period that, that I mean, obviously the election can't be uh, that that seat can't be called until those um, those ballots are in. Um, is there a time scale in terms of how long that needs to happen, or or is it just open until until they're able to be counted? I think I think we I think we just have to be uh, we have to be practical. The, the job of the returning officer is to count the votes both with, um, i.e., as soon as possible. Uh, we'll continue to do that, and until, as you've said, all the all the all the papers are accounted for and counted, uh, no result can be declared. But but every effort will be made to, to make sure that's done uh, as quickly as we can. Okay, thanks, Mark. Just um, thank you, and thanks for that. Just uh, Andy, on the basis of administrators, do you, to those questions, do you have anything to add? Um, no, nothing in particular. I think, uh, as Malcolm said, I think the process just has to be sort of spread out and changed slightly to, to accommodate the, the various rules and the, the time will take. But most return officers and staff um, they have good contingency and they'll do what they can to, to make sure that is done as quickly but possible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we've just got a couple of minutes. Um, if there's anyone, anyone, anything to sum up on? That they might want to ask. If not, then we'll thank our guests. Um, thank you all. Thank you very much to Andy Hunter, uh, to Malcolm Barr, and to Pete Wildman. It's very, very helpful. And thank you all very much for turning up for us this morning. Thank you. Um, we will be moving on to our second panel this morning, uh, which is the Electoral Commission. Uh, we we right on to that? Yep, we're OK. We're ready to move straight on. <laughs> right. And we do have our guests uh, beginning to join us here. Uh, we have a um, second panel from the Electric Commission Scotland, Dame Susan Bruce, Ilza Irvin and Andy O'Neill. And um, unfortunately, as was mentioned, we don't have uh, any time in terms for making uh, statements but uh, due to time constraints. But... I would now like to invite questions from members. And uh, first question, maybe from Neil Neil Finlay. Okay, thanks and good morning. Um, the bill doesn't propose a a delay to the election, although um, it notes that that that's a distinct possibility. And uh, you know that there is uncertainty. There's speculation that the uh, election may may be delayed. Um, so, do you support a decision on the poll being taken? Uh, closer to polling day or earlier. Anyone like to move in on that one first, please? Uh, Susan, Su Dame Susan. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, um, the Commission's viewpoint is that any decisions that can be made about the arrangements for the election, um, where they can be made as early as possible, 
that would be um, beneficial to the arrangements for the election. And we've just been hearing from colleagues from EMB and so on about the, the complexities of, of making arrangements for the election. So um, the Commission's view is any any decisions that can be made, principles of decisions to give certainty as early as possible would be helpful. Neil. Yeah, um, and what we the last thing we want is so, uh, some American style um, delays and uh, controversy around the poll, and we've had our controversies in the past here. Um, uh, the chance, well, nobody knows how things will pan out uh, over the next while, but if we were in a situation where we couldn't ensure that uh, votes were counted uh, in the normal way and the normal time scale, and that we had some parts of the country delaying and other parts finished, is there um, concerns about the, the, the overall integrity of the, the poll and the result? I think, I think under any circumstances, um, returning officers in particular would want to ensure that they can demonstrate the security of ballots during the course of the process, um, in the run-up to the poll itself and, and during the poll. Um, and I think, um, you know, for the... Um, from the, point, from the point of view of the elector, they would also want to see that measures are put in place to ensure that the holding of ballots during the course of the process is secure. Um, so the shorter the process, obviously the better. Um, any delays incurred between the poll itself and the count would, would require that, um, that demonstrable integrity regarding the security of ballots. Can I ask a final point? Is there... Um... Has there been steps taken, uh, any additional steps taken? We only need to look back to the referendum and the uh, wild conspiracy theorists uh, who were t saying that, you know, ballot papers were chucked under desks and all sorts of stuff to um, claim that one side or another was being disadvantaged in the referendum. Um, is there any additional measures that have, take, have been put in place to ensure that if there is a delay, that we can make sure that the, uh, the absolute veracity of the poll is protected? I think, I mean, there, there is existing practice which is um, adopted by ROs. So, for example, in, in the European elections where the, the count is um, separate in time to the, the election itself, um, ROs do have measures in place for the secure storage of ballots. I just think each RO will have to make their own decision um, regarding their own circumstances, um, the buildings they use, security of those buildings, and how that um, those security measures can be demonstrated. Um, I think the, um, as you were saying, there were plenty of um, <coughs> rumours being made during the course of the referendum, and I think they were all successfully. Um, rebutted by the demonstration of the integrity of the process, and uh, I think ROs are quite well tuned to that. Um, anyone uh, else <coughs> or Andy would like to add anything at all? Yeah, I mean, yep, if, if I may come in, I mean, I think yeah, just to just to add to Sue's point, I think the the important thing will be making sure that we communicate clearly um, what decisions are taken at an early stage, because I think helping voters to understand what is going to happen, when it's going to happen, and what to expect, and to manage those expectations in advance will help to build confidence so that they know what to expect. So if results do take time to be declared, I mean, we heard Malcolm talk in the last session about uh, accounts taking longer just simply with needs to be social distanced, actually getting that information out there early and helping voters to understand that and to expect that will help to show that there's nothing funny going on. This is just running the election properly and making sure that things are done in accordance with the rules. Thank you very much for that. And Andy, do you have anything at all to add? Are you okay with that? Can't hear anything. <laughs> All right. I think it's still muted there. So that's. Has he got to unmute? Still muted there, Andy. So that's the problem. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to you. Um... Oh, there you go. There right. you go. I've unmuted. 
Right, that's you fine. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks. Sorry, convener, I've been okay. having uh, IT issues that's just arrived, so I don't actually I'll pass on that one. Okay, no problem, but thank you for that anyway. But thank you. Right. We'll come back to you for another element. <laughs> okay. Um is that you okay, Neil? Is that yeah. fine, thank you very much for that. And uh, John Scott, please. Good morning. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, the bill provides the presiding officer with the power to delay the election if required. In such circumstances, the Electoral Con Commission must be consulted. Do you support the contingency and can you give an indication of the kinds of scenarios in which you may support a delay and the factors you would take into consideration when making your uh, decision? That first, please. Oh, I, Dame, Dame I just Susan. ask Dame yep. Susan first, please. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Um, uh, the Electoral Commission welcomes the provision that's in the draft bill that the Commission should be consulted. And I think that reflects the, the environment that is um, um, present in Scotland where there's an open and transparent dialogue where we try and give our best advice to. Um, government to ministers to form the best um, legislation to support the elections. Um, we've, the Commission has been um, monitoring um, the impact of COVID on, on elections globally. Uh, we have a researcher who's been um, involved in international organisations, international discussions, and um, it is the case that most elections have been able to, to um, be continued with, with measures to help make them safe. So, um, whilst the pandemic is, is still with us, it's still very much a bit of an unknown quantity, um, and it's sensible to have a provision um, for the delay of, of the election. Um, it would seem on the face of it that if, if measures are taken to make sure that polling places are safe, um, that count arrangements are safe, and so on and so forth, it it could very well be possible to run run the democratic process whilst keeping people safe at the same time. So a postponement would be a measure of last resort in in many ways. And you, you heard from colleagues in the electoral administration side earlier on that something like an all-out postal vote would be the kind of thing that would trigger uh, consideration of a delay of the uh, complexity of um, delivering that. So. Um, Given that the bill does make provision for delay, um, that that is uh, the, the last resort fallback position in a sense. We would we, we welcome the fact that we would be consulted on that. But given everything that we've seen and heard, and the possibility to make a safe election happen, um, I think I would probably, if I was asked to make a judgment now, I would err on the side of saying we should aim to proceed, um, but with safe measures in place. Thank you. I mean, on that regard, and with regard to Section 5 of the Bill, uh, uh, and you mentioned an all postal ballot, um, would you agree that um, while at the moment um, it is, must be consulted, would it be better um, that, that it should be that the Electoral Commission should recommend? Um, I think would that put a further safeguard in place, given the enormity of uh, moving um, the whole electoral system in Scotland to an all postal ballot? Would you agree with that? There are those who are of that view, and I'm one of them. Um, it's an interesting question, and um, you know, clearly ministers have got decisions to make in relation to this in terms of um, their preference as to how they see the election run. I think the Electoral Commission would um, would um, take concerns about the possibility of delivering an all-postal ballot unless there was sufficient time given and that it would be a position of last resort. Apart from the, um, the issues of, of um, administering such a thing, um, there is also the risk of, of um, excluding people from an all-postal ballot, people who have perhaps never done it before and who are reluctant, people who maybe have language or literacy issues, people who are reluctant to um, to declare themselves um, openly, um, 
So there are a number of reasons why an all postal ballot might actually disadvantage people who are furthest away from casting their vote in the first place. So from the point of view of social inclusion and maximising participation, and the present model where there's a mix of present voting and postal ballot would maximum opportunity for people to participate. And perhaps my colleague Ailes might have further comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that I agree with, with Sue's point. I think voter choice is a, is a really important element of the uh, electoral process. From the research that we've done, um, while we understand that postal voting is a popular option, we see 18% of the electorate in Scotland choosing to vote by post already, and our research indicating that there could be up to 20% of people who may choose to apply to vote by post if the election took place now against the backdrop of the pandemic. What we also saw from that same research is actually the majority of people think that voting at a polling station would be safe, and the most popular option for casting your vote in an election if it took place now is actually voting in person at a polling station. So limiting that choice uh, would have an impact on, on voters and would have a significant change to how elections in Scotland are run. And I think just to, to build on Sue's point as well, I think the uh, potential to disenfranchise people, um, if we want to keep the integrity safeguards, which I think are really important, so getting people to provide their signature and date of birth that can then be checked against return postal votes. We talk about it could be around 3.4 million electors that we need to get those details from before we can even send them a postal ballot pack with the potential for some to be disenfranchised as part of that process. And then the potential for people to become confused and to make errors when they return their postal ballot pack. We saw when postal identifiers were first introduced around 4% of return postal votes being rejected because they weren't completed correctly. There's a risk there of further people being disenfranchised. So I think there's, there's issues there of people not being able to take part, not being able to cast their vote in the way they intended, and then for the consequent kind of public confidence issues that could emerge from that as well. Um, th thanks very much. That's, that's very clear. Um, a further question is, if the poll is delayed once a short campaign has begun, what are the implications of this? And would the short campaign be longer or would campaigning need to stop and resume closer to a rearranged poll date? How does all that play out if we start and then have to stop? And uh, Sandy, would you... oh, please, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Come in, Sandy. It... Thank you. It depends when the postponement occurs, of course. Uh, the short campaign would start around about the 25th of, of March. Uh, our understanding, and we've had conversations with uh, Scottish Government officials about this, there is provision in the conduct order, uh, which an amendment is going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment, to allow uh, for an increase for the spending limits of up to 50% for candidates. Uh, it would depend if you were suspending, postponing the election for a week or two weeks or whatever, if you go to six months, because campaign, I think our understanding is the ca the candidature of the candidates continues. So if you had six months, you would have a substantially longer short campaign. Uh, so 50% increase, that may work. Uh, there's also an issue around party spending limits. Uh, at the moment, if you suspended towards the end parties, if you stand everywhere, you get, you'll get you know this is about a million and a half spending limit. We've had conversations with Scottish Government officials around the basis of it would need perhaps to introduce a sliding scale of increases, but that's conversations we're having which are ongoing and we're happy to continue working with Scottish Government on that uh, in case the eventuality did occur and so they'd be able to legislate. Okay, John. Right, thank you. Um, I have a kind of bee in my bonnet too about um, MSPs still remaining MSPs up until uh, the day before the election, yet also being candidates. And um, uh, the, the practicalities of coping with that, given um, the anxiety that's out there amongst the population at the moment, and that will only um, be worse um, if this is, situation is still ongoing in such an intense way in, at the beginning of, uh, during April and May. Um, and 
constituents will not really want to differentiate between whether you're a candidate or whether you're an MSP. They will actually just want solutions to their problems and, 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 a, and a coherent response in that regard. Um, uh, and how does all that play out in the Electoral Commission's mind um, about the need to accommodate constituents who, because that is actually what we are there for, uh, to represent the people. If we are still MSPs, yet we are also um, candidates. There's a, there's a very, um, there's almost a conflict there. Uh, yep, Andy O'Neill. Andy O'Neill. Uh, it's probably sorry. It's probably a bit a question best asked uh, to your next panel, uh, David McGill and uh, Hugh Williams, who I believe are coming along. But in a sense, uh, MSPs to us are candidates during the long campaign from sixth of of January every year in leading up to an election. Uh, we regulate what you spend, not what you say. So, in a sense, it, it it really doesn't have anything to do with us, and because it's candidate, we wouldn't regulate it anyway. Because regulation of candidates is a police matter rather than us, who we are the party regulator. So, best ask the next panel. Right. Thank you. Uh, forgive my naivety. I certainly intend to ask the next panel that as well. I just wondered if you had a view on it. That was all. Yeah. Quite likely to ask every panel, but thank you very much. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for that reply, Andy. Um, could we go to Gill, please? Yeah, thanks very much. You support the proposal to allow for polling on additional days if required, and could you outline what you would take into account when making a decision in that regard? We've got it here. Uh, anyone care to take on that question? Uh, Dame Susan Bruce. Convener, um, I think um, the key uh, thing here is to take into account the views of returning officers about the, their estimation of time to make sure a present vote um, would be able to be taken safely through the polling places. You heard from Malcolm in the last session that returning officers are currently reviewing their polling schemes. Um, and will be assessing the polling places that are available to them um, in terms of spacing, timing and all the rest of it. So um, the key thing to take into account would be the estimation of polling, uh, returning officers in terms of the capacity they have within their polling places to um, take the electorate through their votes um, within the time available. Um, the, the other thing to take into account in the event that there were additional days of polling, I would very much support the point of view that Malcolm expressed, which was that the preference would be for consecutive days and not separate days in the event that additional days were required. And I suppose um, ancillary issues to take into account, which probably for a debate in another committee would be, you know, schools are very much used as polling places. And given the disruption to education as a result of the pandemic already, um, a side issue would be consideration of taking schools out for more days than necessary. Okay. And, and in regard to um, do you, in, when it comes to or the lack of consecutive days, if, if the government or a decision was made to spread it uh, somewhat, uh, particularly if it was more than two days, is there a is there maybe a fundamental uh, barrier put in place for the for the public if that takes if that happens by spreading over a, a period of time? I can see Andy on your. Yeah, I think it's. Sorry, Sorry Susan. <laughs> Andy. Sorry, I I I think Sue was about to speak, and then I can speak after. Okay, right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sue. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> part of the, um, the desire for information as early as possible uh, is also to get clarity. And polling over days which are not consecutive would potentially be um, more confusing for members of the public, um, particularly where um, publicity and awareness raising about the election usually takes place in kind of a long run up to the event itself or any published material would need to reflect the decisions about the actuality of the days um, itself. 
Um, there's also, again, the question of the integrity of the, the ballots, the security of the ballots. If the pool is split over non-consecutive days, but that is just another risk that's introduced into the system. The um, ballots already cast would need to be kept somewhere secure um, whilst the um, non-consecutive days were lined up. I'll maybe um, hand back to Andy. Thank you. Andy? <coughs> Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, one, one of the things we developed when uh, COVID hit, the pandemic hit, was uh, some objectives for a successful election in the context of the health crisis. And one of the objectives we, ha we, we believe strongly in, and we developed these with parties and administrators and returning officers across GP, is clarity on matters as soon as possible. And we believe voters are need clarity because they're entitled to know when the day of poll is, uh, so they can get information which is good for them, so they can vote uh, with confidence. Parties and candidates need to know when the day of poll is. EROs and ROs particularly need to know the day of poll, so they can book polling places. There are about 3,000 polling places across Scotland within which there are polling stations, and they need to book the staff. And obviously, if you have more than one polling day, you may need more than the 100% of staff you normally have. On a, on a polling day. So clarity is really important to us. Now, from a, an electoral commission point of view, of course, we have the role of a national public awareness body. Uh, we produce household booklets and stakeholder materials. The booklet normally goes out. It will go out earlier because of the uh, moving of the postal vote deadline into March. We need to know the days of poll by then. Uh, administrators need to know, as I said, polling places. So. What, what we believe is we need to put this on the face of the bill because otherwise we won't be able to administer and prepare for the election. Uh, we think we know the ROs can do the modelling to develop uh, an answer as to whether or not you need one day, two day, and I obviously support Sue's view that uh, consecutive days is better. If all of do the modelling and look at their polling schemes, see if they can do physically distanced polling stations within the polling places, factor in their assumptions around the increase in postal voting, consider the use, non-use of schools, look at, and this is where lessons from some of the by-elections is coming in, look at the length of time for voter throughput. Uh, it is slightly slower, we think, than in uh, a normal poll day context. Uh, people are being asked to sanitise their hands as they go in. They've got masks on. They, they, everyone's socially distanced. Things are cleaned. Uh, certainly, when I was in uh, one of the by-elections, uh, only individual voters or family groups were allowed into the polling station at any one time. That, in a busy polling station, can develop uh, a queue. All of this can be looked at, and we can get an answer as to do we need one day, two day, or whatever. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's also re really interesting, the lessons from the by-elections, which we're doing a report on and we'll produce and we'll send you a copy uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, I think one of the things coming back from the Deputy Returned Officers is everything is taking slightly longer to administer because everyone's either not always in the office, they're working from home, the people they're trying to contact in terms of put, uh, polling place venues, uh, some of them aren't there, uh, you know, it's harder to contact. So what we would say is we need to be doing that now, not as the bill is currently uh, framed, which would not give us certainty until the end of January or early February. So we, we would rather like the, the work to be done by the returning officers to come up for an answer, to give some advice to the Scottish Government and then bring forward an amendment, probably at stage three. Okay. Well, thank Thanks you very much. much. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Sue. Um, okay, Patrick, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to our witnesses. Um, in discussing the the possibility of all postal voting uh, a wee bit earlier, Elsa Irving uh, Irvin mentioned the research that the commission has done. I'd like to ask about postal voting more generally uh, and what that research tells us. The the suggestion that I would make is that research conducted right before the second wave, when the UK government was telling everybody, go on, eat out to help out, and we should all be getting back into the office, may not tell us very much uh, about what people's attitudes are now, 
uh, and less still about what people's attitudes will be in the spring about the likely uptake of postal voting. We don't know what situation we'll be in by spring. We might have vaccines rolling out and everybody feeling a lot more confident and optimistic and upbeat uh, about the, the prospects uh, in the first few months of next year. Or the vaccine rollout might be given to a special advisor's brother-in-law's startup company. It all goes wrong and we're into a third wave, right? So surely the most serious thing that we can say is that we simply don't know what the likely uptake and demand for postal voting is going to be, rather than assuming that this high 30% is, is something that can be relied on. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Ilsa, you were mentioned there. <laughs> Yep, um, I can say that. Yep, I think I think it is a challenge, absolutely a challenge, to be able to predict accurately um, what kind of levels of postal voting we're dealing with. What we've done with the research is is to really try and give a a bit of a predictor of voter behaviour. We know it can't be taken as a as an accurate figure as to what's going to happen on voting day. And just to clarify on the timing of the research, we did carry out that research uh, initially in August. We have actually just carried out that research again. Um, we're still in the process of finalising the analysis of the figures and we'll be in a process to publish that later this month. But as a sneak preview of that, essentially it's telling us exactly the same story as it told us back in August. So we haven't seen a shift in public opinion over that period as yet. But as you say, that's not to say that things won't change again. I mean, you know, it may well change as it moves forward. Likewise, that the by-elections that we've seen taking place in Scotland from the dialogue we've had with the electoral registration officers and the data we've seen from them, we haven't seen any increase in postal votes uh, yet materialising in the in the by-elections that have taken place. We've seen high levels of turnout from postal voters, but not any increase in the levels of people voting by post. But I think that does all underline that uncertainty, the real importance of the electoral registration officers working to build the capacity within their systems so that they can respond to and deal with whatever level of applications they do get through. And I think as well as making sure that the capacity is there to deal with whatever happens, it is also an important role for public awareness and helping voters to understand at an early stage what their options for casting a vote are. And one of the activities that we've started now is providing resources for local authorities that they can be using from this point that helps them to be clear to voters, not only that polling stations are safe places to vote, but there are other options for casting your vote. And if you want to post a vote, you should apply early. It's trying to do as much as we can to spread out that peak of applications and encourage people to vote, to register for a postal vote early, while recognising, of course, that people are deadline driven. And regardless of how much activity we try to do this far, it will be a limit to how effective that can be. But it is just trying, it's a combination of all these things to try and spread out the flow of applications, build the capacity and best understand the picture. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. And it's, it's particularly helpful to know that there's a follow up to that research coming. Uh, I, I hope we might be able to see uh, the output of that before we get to the, the stage three pro process on this bill. Uh, and I see some heads nodding. That's that's really helpful to know. Um, I suppose that given some of what came up in the last panel, uh, suggesting that it's uh, and what Ilsa just said as well, that it's the registration process uh, that's the problem and that trying to get that that registration early on would be helpful. Uh, you know, I, I got the impression from the last panel that the administrators, understandably, uh, would say it's not for our, it's not our position uh, to tell people that they should register for a postal vote, uh, uh, that it's a matter of free choice. I imagine the Commission uh, would also be in a position of wanting to give people neutral information rather than proactively encouraging uh, registration for a postal vote. Um, if it's a sensible thing to do to encourage early registration for postal votes to smooth that process, whose job is it to be proactive about that, uh, to be actively encouraging people to register for a postal vote, uh, if that's the way that the system's going to work more smoothly? Anyone wish to take that one on board? Uh, Ilsa again, and maybe follow up from Andy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the important thing um, from our perspective is making sure that voters understand the options so that they can plan for whatever method is best for them. So that if people want to vote in person at a polling station, they go ahead and do that. But if people think that voting by post, particularly in this context, because they don't want to vote in person, they don't feel able to vote in person, that they know what they need to do and that they have that information early. Um, so I think it isn't really about promoting one type over another, but it's about recognising that voters have different needs and making sure that we uh, raise that with, with different groups of electors. One thing we are thinking about is 
for those uh, groups of uh, voters who are potentially clinically more vulnerable to COVID, thinking about whether we can target messaging at them so that they understand what they need to do to be able to vote by post so they can put arrangements in place early. So it is about channeling messages to, to the correct groups and providing the information they need. I think we absolutely see ourselves as having a role in that with a public awareness function to make sure that we are raising uh, awareness of the options and providing voters with the information they need. But it's also clearly a role for returning officers, EROs, local authorities, and of course, uh, candidates and parties are going to want to make sure that their voters understand um, how they need to uh, engage in the process as well. So I think it is something that's shared collectively uh, across the electoral community. And just, to, just to follow up very briefly on that, surely, I mean, it may be that the demand is lower than, than we, we might fear at the moment, but part of the information that people need is you may not be able to get a postal vote if you register too late. Because if there's, if there's going to be a limit and if there's a risk that that limit is reached, people may be turned away for a postal vote when they genuinely need one. Um, Andy? Yeah. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Elsa first, then Andy. Sorry. I was, I was just going to say, I think the important thing is we're trying to build the capacity so no one is turned away. I think we'd be very concerned if we got to a position that someone wasn't able to uh, cast their vote in the way that they intended and it wasn't able to be processed. But I think that is why we're taking the action now to try and start reaching out to voters to get them to think about applying for a vote early so that they can get that postal pack turned around and sent to them as quickly as possible. I think it is about timing and phasing um, of activity, but I think it would be a concern if we weren't seeing uh, applications being able to be processed and people not able to cast their vote, which is why the capacity of the element is also absolutely critical. Thank you. And Andy, do you want to add to that? Hey, just briefly, I think the, pr the principle of the bill which we support is in-person voting plus lots and lots of postal voting, which we expect. I think we need to remember that 77% of people actually uh, feel po polling places are safe, and 54% in our research tells us that they want to vote in person. And our job is to try and ensure that they understand all the options available. Uh, we give them those options and we encourage them to use them. Now, what we're saying currently is if people want to get a postal vote, apply early. Uh, we understand the problem of the spike, and that's why Scottish Government and others have been working with the EROs. Uh, to build capacity, but uh, we, as part of our uh, national campaign, will will do our usual TV uh, booklets, uh, digital stuff about how to register and how to uh, how to vote on the day. But also, we're producing resources and working with lots of stakeholders to understand the various uh, ways of voting. And included in that is understanding apps and voting. Uh, so we're working with people like uh, COSLA and uh, local authorities, resettlement officers, Scottish Refugee Council, the Parliament, Education Scotland, BMA groups and disability groups. So we are we are seeking to get those messages out. Uh, what, what, to go back to the early thing about days of poll, part of the part of the issue was being able to have all these resources, actually having all the right information in them, and these things are getting finalised now. So that that's why we well, that's why we are very big on clarity. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Neil Finlay, please. Yeah. One of the ways that we could help uh, encourage people to take up their uh, option to vote and, uh, and be as inclusive as possible is for a free post address uh, for electoral registration and postal voting. Um, do you support that uh, option? Anyone care to take that on board? Andy O'Neill? No. <laughs> Was it? Does that mean no, or does that mean oh. you don't know? <laughs> Dame Susan, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's, it's not actually something we've uh, discussed, but um, you know, free post address might in encourage people to um, to participate where they might not otherwise if they have to put a stamp on. I suppose the, the question here is who funds it. Um, so that that would come down to the nuts and bolts of it, but the principle of it would would be inclusive. Neil, thank you. Any other any other comments from the panel? No. I'm surprised at that, given that you are the people who are involved in th this oh. key element of our democracy. Well, I'm surprised Andy, that you don't have a view. I think Andy O'Neill wants to say something there. Well, I mean, 
in the end of the day, it will be for EROs and ROs. It, it's a matter of funding, I suppose, is what you're talking about. Right, that's uh, the elections of, are funded by mechanism known as the fees and charges order. Uh, if you would provide returning officers and AROs uh, with resources to provide free post addresses, uh, they will be able to do it. Otherwise, I suspect they would say to you, we don't have the resource to do that. No, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Thank you. Thanks very much for those answers. Um, Maureen, please. Maureen, what? Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I think you've previously uh, said for a number of years now that you're not in favour, the Electric Commission is not in favour of all postal ballots, and Ailsa, you've said that it could effectively disenfranchise uh, up to 1.5 million electors. Are there any steps that can be taken to mitigate the risk of disenfranchising all these people? Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, mean, I think if we did find ourselves in the position of, of holding an all postal ballot, then then clearly uh, we would be undertaking work uh, from a public awareness uh, campaign perspective to try to encourage people to do what they needed to do to get themselves onto the postal voting register so that they could vote. We'd also work really closely with the local authorities, with the ROs and the ROs, to help make sure that the information provided to electors is as clear and concise as possible so that they understand how to complete their postal ballot pack to try to reduce the risk of people completing it wrongly and having it uh, rejected before it gets to the count. So there is activity that could be undertaken uh, to try to, to mitigate the risk. But I think uh, recognising that there's always a lot of diminishing returns uh, when you're trying to uh, contact electors and ask for them to to do something. We've seen that, for example, when we uh, carried out the transition to the individual electoral registration system that households were all required to uh, to reply to, that with every round of reminders that EROs uh, issued, there still was a rump at the end of people that just simply didn't respond. So I think we will see that however much action we take to mitigate it, there will still be a rump of people that would effectively be unable to vote um, or to vote the way they intended if, if there was an all postal ballot. But absolutely, if it did happen, if it was retained as a contingency measure and was used as that backstop, then we would do everything we can to make sure that it works effectively. Maureen? <clears throat> so, Section 5 is about an all postal election, and uh, the ministers have said that they, they don't intend to use it. But if their circumstances change, that it um, makes all postal voting, <coughs> excuse me, more or less inevitable. Um, it, he, it, the bill does say that ministers uh, have to consult the presiding officer, yourselves, the convener of the EMB, um, and the chief medical officer. Um, <coughs> it's unclear um, what, how you'll be consulted, whether you, the views of yourselves and others will be weighted and whether those views would be made public. <coughs> Excuse me, what are your expectations on this? Uh, Ilsa Irvin, please. <coughs> yeah, I, mean, I think we, we absolutely think transparency is really important here. Um, and I think you know, in, in terms of certainly our views, um, we would be making those available transparently regardless of, of whichever process was in place. But I think any decision uh, that's so fundamental about how elections are run should be taken with as broader range of input um, as possible. And I think you know, we've seen that in the process to develop the bill to where it is, that it's involved all of the electoral community, people from across the political spectrum coming together and feeding in views. And we want any decision as significant as this to be taken in a similar way, a consultative way, with the views um, underpinning it made available clearly and transparently so that the public can have confidence in the rationale behind the decision and, and who's been involved in reaching it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsa. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we can move on to elements on the Gould principle. And Jamie Halker Johnson, please. Um, thanks very much, Convener. Can I just come back on that on that last point? Um, I didn't point for supplementary because I knew I was speaking next. So, um, you know, the points have been made about dif disenfranchisement, exclusion, confusion, etc. Et et Given that, do you think that the uh, power, the responsibility to um, to, to call a, 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 an all postal ballot should be solely in the hands of minister, even with consultation with other groups? Or do you think there should be, or what would be, be your position on kind of further safeguards, perhaps the presiding officer consent, um, 
uh, and Parliament voting um, on it. Okay, thank you. Anyone like to take that one on board? Regarding the Gould principles? Uh, Ilsa, please, Go first, on. and then Andy, I think. Actually, that's the way the hands went up. <laughs> Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, I think the. Can you hear Elsa? No. Okay, we'll try to go to Andy first and we can come back then, please. Thank you. Andy O'Neill? Um, can you going, hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, postponement and all postals. I mean, obviously, as the bill is uh, currently drafted, uh, the presiding officer uh, can uh, postpone up to six months. And I think that is written in the context of a very extreme situation occurring. I mean, I think if you were going to move, and obviously, ministerial uh, SIs can be I made to develop an old postal, but you, I, I would envisage uh, a debate taking place because there'll be other things uh, occurring. Uh, for instance, we referred to earlier about potential for uh, spending limits needing to be changed. It, it depends when you do it, uh, but I would, I would expect a parliamentary debate, and it, that would cover all of these sort of things. It, it certainly would seem more transparent to us. Hey, Jim. Okay. Um, thanks very much. And just just on another, another point on that, um, when we were speaking to the Electoral Management Board and the EROs earlier, um, they suggested that um, a six month delay for an all postal ballot, um, you know, would probably be a minimum, a minimum. But they're looking at the technical delivery of of, of a postal ballot. Um, you know, you've talked about dis disenfranch uh, disenfranchisement and exclusion on the basis of people may not know how to vote, so uh, you know, and, and may not be comfortable voting by post. So there'll be a big education job as well. If there was a delay because of a postal ballot, uh, an all postal ballot, what, how long would you consider the minimum required to do the information educational sites to make sure that disenfranchisement didn't did happen? Would, would six months, do you think, be a, a suitable period, or would would you consider it needing it to be longer? Okay. Um, anyone care to come in first, Andy or Neil, please? Andy. Yep. When colleagues will support me, no doubt, uh, or di or disagree. Uh, I mean, in a sense, the more time you get, the more robust the old postal register, the AV register you would have for an old postal. Uh, and that is actually true for public awareness uh, campaigns as well. The longer time uh, you get, the better the campaign. Uh, obviously, there'd be a funding question around that. The parliament would need to fund us to do it. Uh, I think our, our key concern is six months seems awfully ambitious to get 3.4 million uh, AVIs uh, from applicants. Uh, which they would have to write from a standing start, presumably sometime in the first quarter of next year. We just see that as a real challenge, and uh, you know you're going to finish up. And I think the policy memorandum refer refers to this something like 16 to 30 odd percent of the electorate may not get their applications uh, of, uh, with EVIs in in time. In addition to that, you would you will get a number of those who are. Uh, of then postal voters not returning the AVI correctly. I mean, currently, I think the last election we had something in Scotland like 11,000 people didn't uh, respond correctly with the AVI. Effectively, their vote didn't get counted. Build on that, you've got a lot of people who have never used a postal vote before. You're inevitably, we think, going to finish up with more people, even though they've applied, uh, given the AVI and they've got the postal pallet, ballot pack rather, uh, they don't return it correctly, uh, the AVI is incorrect and they don't uh, get into the vote. Now, you can put in mitigating public awareness campaigns uh, to try and uh, ameliorate some of that, but inevitably you're going to finish up with more people who are not uh, getting their vote vote counted. Also, there are people who just simply don't trust postal voting uh, and, and some will not uh, apply because of that. So, I mean, uh, we we've always supported a range of options 
Uh, obviously, we're recognising that a pandemic exists, and in certain circumstances, you may finish up going down that route. But we would much prefer if people, and this is the principle of the bill, can vote in person where the majority of people want to do, plus those who uh, feel, for whatever reason, uh, a postal vote or a proxy vote or whatever uh, suits them, they, they use that mechanism. OK. Yeah, John Scott. Now, we've got five minutes left uh, in this panel, so make it short and sweet, please. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, just on that subject, uh, Andy, you I mentioned uh, the use of statutory instruments by ministers. Uh, were such a, an eventuality to occur, would you agree that it should be an affirmative instrument rather than any other uh, kind of instrument where such a, an ap ap apocalyptic um, scenario to occur? Uh, Andy, apocalypse now, or what? Uh, uh, I don't think we've ever... Uh, but I, I suspect in the circumstances you'd finish up with a parliamentary debate, uh, we would, we, and we would want our advice, which would be asked, to be aired publicly. So we'd, we'd certainly go down uh, the view of uh, matter and transparency. But, of course, you might finish up in a situation where uh, things uh, need to move very quickly. Right. OK. okay. In terms of Thank you. Jamie, do you just want to sum up on that? Yeah, sorry. I just, just uh, because I did have questions around the kind of other... So I'll try and bring my questions into all to one. Firstly, if you could tell us any concerns you have with the... Um, Dual principle and any particular need for flexibility around that, given the circumstances we we'll, would we'll, we'll like to find or could find ourselves in. Um, do you support um, provision in the bill which would um, uh, allow a more practical approach to a Parliament needing to sit within seven days of the poll, um, if there are any of the other issues around that as well? And obviously, um, election um, observers at election counts and, and throughout the process uh, of polling is vital um, as we've seen perhaps from our, um, from across the the pond so could you tell us what plans are being put in place to ensure that observers can be involved in the election and safely so and Dilsa Irvin please yeah thank you so I think on, on the go principle I think you, you know you have heard us sit here so many times before and talk about the importance of having rules in place six months before they need to be complied with and we're sitting here now, um, you know, we're looking at a, a bill that we expect would be in place uh, by the end of the year, which is, is only four months before polling day, essentially. Um, but actually, we recognise that the circumstances of the pandemic mean we do need to be more flexible than would ordinarily be the case. And we welcome the fact that the Scottish Government have brought together uh, people to look at solutions, looking at this bill, looking at changes to the conduct order to try to make sure that the elections can be run safely. But that said, you know, the goal principle is there for a reason. Um, there are risks that increase the closer you get to a poll if you make changes. So I think that's why we are saying that we would like to see as much as we can decided and ended with the passing of this bill so that there is clarity by the end of this year, four months out, so that everybody involved in the poll can get on and plan within those parameters, recognising that the closer you get to the poll, the more changes you make. The, the greater the risks are to being able to implement them successfully, the greater the risks there are to voter confusion because they end up getting conflicting messages or messages that were correct at one point that then need to change. And all of these things taken together can lead to an undermining public confidence in the process. So I think it is recognising that there is a need to be more flexibility, and that's why I think we're, we're happy to be here and be involved in these conversations now, but recognising that those, those risks underneath that haven't gone away. Um, I think on the point about um, observers to the process, I think it's absolutely important that we still have that oversight and transparency of the processes so that um, observers, whether that be appointed um, party agents, uh, people there on behalf of candidates to scrutinise the process, or whether that be accredited observers through the Commission's statutory scheme. I think it is important that people are still able to attend. We do recognise that there will be practical challenges. There may need to be limits to numbers. There may need to be distancing requirements in place. We really are working with returning officers to try to provide them with as much guidance and support as possible to set up their processes in such a way that there is that transparency and there is that level of access, because it is a real critical, important part of the process that we wouldn't want to see lost. Thank you very much for that. OK, then, Jamie. Um, yeah, the only other the only other question there was about um, the provision in the bill to allow the first meeting of the new parliament to be as soon as practical, rather than within seven days of the poll. I don't know. I mean, you may not have any particular position on that, but if there is, 
Um, it'd yeah. be useful yep. to Andy O'Neill first, please. Well, we've not got much time, but Andy O'Neill, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it doesn't really uh, any impact on us. I mean, uh, for us, it's about the length of time of the count, and I think we're all recognising that counts are going to take longer uh, than previous, and therefore the provisions to change it uh, to as soon as practical seem sensible. Okay, thank you very much. Right, and um, I do apologise that we had to rush a wee bit at the end there, but I'd like to very much thank Dame Susan Bruce, Ailsa Irvin, and Andy O'Neill for some terrific um, information. Uh, to the questions that we have asked, and thank you all very much. And we'll see you again soon, and thank you. And I'm um, just suspend. Thank you. Suspend uh, this session of the Parliament at the moment, please, for five minutes. Thank you.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, just coming on to our third panel today. Um, I'm happy to welcome uh, with us David McGill, Chief Executive of the Scottish Parliament, and Hugh Williams, uh, who makes the Chief Executive's office run, apparently. Uh, so so uh, welcome to you both, and thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we're not going to have opening statements because of limitations on time. Uh, so the first uh, question will come from Jamie Halcrow Johnson, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning um, to you both. Um, can you uh, talk us through the financial implications of not having um, a dissolution period, um, you know, particularly in relation to the additional costs? Is, is what's included in the financial memorandum of the bill accurate in terms of some of those costs? And also, how would that differ if there was uh, a delay to the poll, for example, of six months? Yeah, I can say that the uh, costs that are set out in the financial memorandum are accurate. We were um, uh, lucky enough to be involved in contributing to those uh, figures that were in there. So the main costs for the corporate body lie, as you suggest, with the, um, the fact that dissolution doesn't take place until 24 hours before the election. That equates to um, an extra six weeks or so salary for those members who would normally have stood down at the end of March um, and now won't do t so until the, the, the 5th of May. So our calculations there, at the moment we have 27 members who we know are in that category. So it's um, six weeks salary for 27 members, which comes to around about £265,000. There are other costs over and above that. Th those costs include pension and national insurance contributions. Um, Similarly, for member staff who may stay on during that period as well, um, we've calculated a maximum there, again based on an additional six weeks salary for um, the requisite number of staffs up to that maximum. It may be that some of those staff move on anyway before that period, so that is a maximum figure that we have there. There will also, over and above those salary costs, there will be, there'll be a slight increase in resettlement grants and that's on the basis that resettlement grants will now be payable on the, the, the 5th of May. So we'll win to a new financial year. The costs will be uplifted for 21-22 costs, as will salary costs, of course. We don't know what that is just now, but that will be, be a small increase there. And there may be some additional costs that we can't quantify just yet in relation to members' local offices. If leases are extended to cover that extra period, they may be, they may not be. Um, so we're working just now, going to start a, a programme of work with members to see what their intentions are for local offices so that we can start to gather those financial costs as well. Thanks. Uh, um, j j just to go, uh, firstly, um, uh, what consultation have there been with MSPs? As yet, has, has there been any? And secondly, just to, in, in relation to the point I asked about uh, if there was a delay to um, yeah. delay to the election as well, how that might impact? Yeah, there's been no consultation with MSPs that I'm aware of since the bill was introduced. The political parties were all involved in um, the, the policy development before the bill was introduced, um, but we haven't now gone out to uh, members yet to talk about their intentions around about this period. Yeah, and on that other point about if the, the election is delayed any further, um, we don't see any additional costs because um, all of the costs um, that, that would be incurred um, our course that would be incurred anyway, if we have an election, we have our 129 members, um, we have the member staff in place, so a delay to the election doesn't increase the costs. Um, j just a last point, could that impact on resettlement um, costs, for example, in six months' time? Yes. Um, um, resettlement costs are based on um, every year of service, so I don't think, because the bill limits the, the ability of the election to be delayed to six months, we wouldn't kick into an extra year, but there would just be that marginal increase because we would be on to whatever uplift the corporate body puts on salaries because it's a factor of, of salaries for 21-22, so there'd just be a marginal increase in resettlement costs. Okay. Uh, um, the question. I had another question on terms of the code of conduct, but I think this may be going to be covered in Patrick's question. So, right. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you, um, Patrick. Please. Oh, yeah, on, oh, yeah, on that point. Yes. Okay. Go. Yep. In that regard, if the Parliament was extended by six months, uh, both in in terms of salaries, uh, but status. What would the status of an MSP be during that six-month period? 
the status would be as an MSP. Um, MSP status continues until the Parliament is dissolved. So even with a delayed election, that dissolution doesn't take place until 24 hours before the delayed election takes place. And that would be the same for six months, would it? It would, exactly. yes, yes. The bill has a mechanism so that dissolution follows the date of the election. And, and I'll state, uh, you've got an interest, and that includes folk that had already decided that they would retire. That's, that's unless they leave the parliament. Exactly. I mean, a, a member can stand down at any point if he or she so down. wishes. But yes, right. um, if a member doesn't do that, they retain the status of MSP until the parliament's dissolved. Right. Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing that up, Gil. Uh, thank you. And uh, Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to the witnesses. Um, the corporate body normally issues guidance to MSPs and staff uh, about um, parliamentary procedures, parliamentary resources in the context of an election. What's, um, what's being considered? What are the factors that you have in mind for a, an update, a revision to that guidance, particularly in light of the, uh, the proposal to effectively do away with a, a dissolution period of any length? Yes, the, the, the changes that this bill brings about have um, significant implications for the guidance that we normally issue. Um, in the, the run-up to an election, the corporate body normally issues guidance round about October. It was all set to do that this time, but obviously we were aware that this bill was coming down the, the tracks, so we delayed that until we could see what the implications of the bill were. The corporate body will hopefully sign off guidance at its meeting a week today and get that out to members as soon as possible thereafter. But there are a number of issues that, that we have to consider um, relating to the implications for that MSP status being retained right up until the, the date of the election. So the guidance will be looking at issues round about um, the, the ability of the parliament to meet in that time, what we do um, with all of the, the parliamentary side of, of, of things. So the overall approach that the corporate body is considering here is one in which we mirror as far as we, we possibly can a normal dissolution period. Um, and that gives us cover in terms of the level playing field that the corporate body usually likes to see for an election period. So normally um, in a period of, of normal dissolution, um, we as parliamentary officials are effectively saying we can't support you because you're no longer an MSP. The situation that the corporate body wants to replicate it would, would amount to us saying notwithstanding the fact that you are still an MSP, we can't support you. And that's because the, the corporate body doesn't want to, uh, it, public money to be used to give any candidate an election an advantage over other candidates. So the, the, the guidance will cover all sorts of issues that, that's normally covered in terms of um, the building being closed to members, uh, members packing up their offices at the, the what would have been the date of dissolution and so on. There's a further conversation that needs to be had with the Parliamentary Bureau in terms of um, the parliamentary business side of things. So they have an interest in what happens to parliamentary questions and motions, um, bills that fall at dissolution, whether committees can meet during what will be a period of recess rather than a period of dissolution. But our hope there is that the Bureau will take a similar stance that to all intents and purposes this is treated as a, a period of dissolution and none of these things that could happen because MSPs are retaining their status should happen. So if, for example, we this may not be the case, but if we are still in a position where uh, there's a weekly revision to the levels of restrictions uh, under the emergency coronavirus legislation, uh, and that requires to be scrutinised during the what would normally be a dissolution period, but is in this case a recess, uh, you would anticipate parliamentary business being conducted either in committee or in some other way to undertake that scrutiny? I think in those circumstances we would, um, because it's, it's obviously valid that the government is held to account during this period. Um, and a similar process to what happened over this summer recess, where we, we had a period of recess, but we had planned recalls to allow the parliament to do that. I think that would be something that the, the Bureau would want to look at carefully for this period of recess, notwithstanding that it's also a period of election campaigning. And in a normal dissolution period, uh, MSPs, whether they are restanding or not, are, are not expected to take on new constituency casework. They, their offices can complete existing casework, 
but they can't take on new casework. If we're in this kind of situation where changes to the levels are still being implemented week on week or al other alterations to the restrictions, that in itself will generate casework, uh, some of which is extremely urgent and, and really important to people's quality of life and ability to go about their, their, their lives and their businesses. What, what approach is going to be taken to that, that issue of new casework uh, and uh, how, how will people be expected to understand whatever restrictions exist on their sitting MSPs who are making decisions potentially week on week during this period uh, in, in relation to, you know, how, how can I get a, a decent service from my MSP in, in relation to those, those issues? Yeah, this is something that the corporate body will be looking at on Thursday when it hopefully finalises the guidance. But again, I think the corporate body's um, instinct is to replicate what normally happens in a dissolution period, um, and that is that the Parliament's resources can't be used to support members in taking on new casework. There's nothing to prevent members taking on new casework. Other candidates in the election can do so, but members should do that as candidates and not as MSPs. So, for example, the corporate body's view, I think, will be that members can do that, recognising the situation that we're in as, as a country. But, for example, space resources can't be used um, by somebody who's a candidate in the election simply because, uh, by virtue of the fact that they, they happen to be an MSP, um, whereas other candidates wouldn't have access to those parliamentary resources to help them with, with that casework. And, and finally on this point, I, I suspect other members may want to come in on this, but finally for me on this point, um, the, there's a question of consequences. Whatever the set of rules are, whatever the expectation is, on members, those who are returned after the election, uh, potentially there could be a, a process in relation to the code of conduct. Um, uh, perhaps coming to this committee, this this committee's successor, uh, to judge if if um, if a member, while being both a candidate and a member, has contravened the rules. Yeah. There could be no consequences like that that I can see uh, for a member. Uh, who during that period also broke the rules, but who then hasn't been returned to Parliament. How is that going to be dealt with? Th that's a, an admitted weakness with the system. When we were looking at the issue of sanctions, there were four main options, really. The first one was for something to be included in the bill, um, but that was felt to be disproportionate. It would create illegality because there are lots of grey areas here as well. It might have been very difficult to, to enforce all of that. At the other extreme, we can do nothing in recognition of the fact that members remain members up until the, the day before the election. And then two options within that. One was for this just to be um, in guidance. Um, the weakness there is that that lacks any teeth at all. So taking everything into account, we thought it was best that the corporate body issues a policy statement, and in doing so, that then invokes the terms of the Code of Conduct and the role that this committee would, would uh, quite clearly have and all of that. But that is a weakness um, where somebody who's a, an MSP candidate um, is not returned. There is no sanction once investigations take place after the election. I mean, some may feel that that person who um, has fallen foul of rules about using parliamentary resources or using public resources to try and gain an electoral advantage, well, they clearly didn't because they weren't returned, and that might be seen to be enough of a sanction on that person. But um, it's, it's not something that we can legislate for in every case and make sure that every single case can be treated in the same way, and I think we'd probably just have to accept that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, right, we have a very short one time, so I'm going to say we've got... Hmm? Oh, well, I'm not finished yet, thank you. Uh, very short on time, so we've got uh, John Scott, uh, Neil and Gill. Thank you. No, no thank, thank you, um, convener. Um, I just want to reaffirm what Patrick has said, and he's expressed it pretty elegantly, but I have concerns about being both a candidate and an MSP at the same time, whenever the election is. And with the levels of anxiety in the community, constituents won't readily accept being told that although I am still, a, or one is, still an MSP, um, we're unable to take out their case. And Patrick spoke of con consequences. The consequences might be electoral in that regard, because if a, a sitting MSP refuses to take up somebody's case, and then the constituent may very well say, well, I'm not going to vote for you. So the, the, there's a whole 
a whole area of um, concern in there, and I hear what you say. That one can take that up as a as a, as a candidate, in, in, as the way one has in the past. But um, I, I do think this needs a great deal of thought how this is dealt with, because there's a, there, uh, I'm not certain that what you've said is sufficient, David, thus far. I'm, I entirely accept that there are a range of views, but this is what the corporate body is grappling with here, and I think what's guiding the corporate body before it makes final decisions, so I can't, I can't say what the corporate body's final position in this is, but what, what's guiding it at the moment is the underlying principle that nothing should be done during a, an election campaign which could be seen to prejudice the outcome of that election. And I think the, the corporate body's starting point is the use of parliamentary resources has the ability to give one candidate an election an advantage over another candidate. So that's, that's what it's looking to finalise um, next Thursday when it looks at the, the draft guidance. Okay. That, uh, Neil, please. Um, yeah, on that, if I've picked you up right, David, then um, it would be for a candidate who is seeking to return, they, they, they would clearly be subject to a sanction if they abuse that position. Um, a candidate like myself who is not seeking to return would not be subject to any sanctions. Is that, is that correct? The, this committee doesn't have the ability to sanction former members, no, and by the time the like, investigation took place, yeah. somebody in your position would be a former member, yeah. yes. And, and I've experienced that in local government where someone came, you know, ended up going to prison, but they, uh, there was no consequence of their action because um, they had lost their seat, so there was, no, there was no consequence on their ability to stand again for election or anything like that. That's a big issue. But presumably what I could do then is I could say, well, I'm not standing, but I'll tell you what, I've got a computer with loads of access to loads of people, and I can send out information saying, I want you to vote for this candidate, that candidate, or the next candidate. I could do it with loads of letters on Parliament stamps. I could spend all my allowance, keep it and spend it at the last minute, and nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. Um, I've given my tactics away, I know. But that, that's the reality of what could happen. And uh, secondly, other point I would like to raise is in terms of if dissolution is happening the day, the day before the election, then that gives a lot of power to the government, presumably to make announcements, statements um, uh, in Parliament that would have a, could have a significant impact on the election. Yes, um, I think the, the government is obviously covered by PUDA um, arrangements before an election period, but one of the things that we've been looking at is, especially if the election is delayed for any period of time, that if the government starts to move into other areas, whether it's COVID-related or not, the parliament should certainly be mirroring that. So if the government does, if the government is freed up from PUDA restrictions, we need the parliament to be in a place to scrutinise and to hold the government to account for, for what it's doing during that longer period of time. <laughs> Much and Gil, please, thank you. Yeah, um, you similar question. Uh, Mines is on the, the six month extension. Uh, just for clarity, are we talking about the campaign period, the month, the, the, the short campaign? That, but not if there's an extension for six months, it wouldn't be a, the status of an MSP would be the same for that period, six months, and we could deal with caseload and do everything that's normal. But then a month before the election, then that's when these restrictions that you're suggesting might come into play. Have I got that? Exactly, yes. I mean, as I said, the bill allows for the election to be delayed up to six months, so any, any longer period three, four, five, six months, we do expect um, some sort of normal parliamentary business to resume because the, the country needs its parliament during that period of time. But regardless of when the election takes place, we would still expect that campaign period to be the six-week period before the election, and that would be um, a period of parliamentary recess, and then 24 hours before the election is the official dissolution of the parliament whenever the election takes place. Okay, that's clear, thanks. Thank you. And um, uh, Jamie, just uh, quickly, please. Yeah, very, very quickly. Two, th two things. One, um, have there been any changes or discussions or concerns around government perda in terms of timescales or what, what would be allowed? And secondly, um, do, do you have any concerns or have there been any discussions about concerns about how MSPs who are candidates may be exposed by still being subject to the Code of Conduct 
up until the day before the election. For example, um, if they if they don't respond to a piece of um, correspondence because they think it's a campaign thing, but it might be that the individual might consider it being sent to an MSP. Have there been concerns around that? I'm not aware of any concerns, but members are probably coming to this pretty fresh um, on the, the introduction of the bill this Monday. But these are issues that, that we've been considering and will make that clear in guidance that the, the Code of Conduct continues to apply during that, that extended period before the election. Okay. Um, in relation to questioning government PURDA, I've not had any discussions with government on PURDA restrictions for the, the circumstances that were in, in the run up to this election. Okay, thanks, David. Thank you very much. Um, John, do you want to say something quite quickly on question 32 that you were allocated there? Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, the bill gives the presiding officer the power to fix a new date for the poll if he considers it necessary or appropriate for any reason to do so, and the Parliament cannot meet to consider legislation to delay the poll because of COVID-19, do you have any concerns about the generality of that power, or should it be tightened up? I think we're quite comfortable with, with what's in, in there. I mean, we, we'd look that if there is a day, delay to the election, it would be considered, first of all, but through legislation. Um, primary legislation, not secondary legislation for the avoidance of doubt. That, that's our um, understanding that if we're in the circumstances where the Parliament is, is recalled to consider an extension to the election, that it would need a, an adjustment to the, this Act through primary legislation, yes. That's, that's fine. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um There's clearly... Um, uncertainty about when the first meeting of Parliament will be. Um, I just wondered what your, plan, what your plans are for that. And, you know, obviously swearing in is a big um, thing in a person in a new MSP's life. Um, we haven't had members of the public in this place for months now. Um, are you making contingencies for family members um, to be able to, to witness that? And um, if I can roll all my questions together, um, you know, um, are, are you envisaging social distancing still to be in place, probably? And it would be awful to think about it, but, you know, do you envisage the first meeting of Parliament, the election of a, a new PO, all of that? Is that going to be here for members, or do you still envisage it to be hybrid? Yeah, taking the, the, the points of raising turn there, I mean, first of all, we, we welcome the flexibility in the bill for the, the, the date of the first meeting of the Parliament to be a bit later than the, the statutory seven days as things stand just now. Um, we've got so much that needs to be done in that period of time in terms of registering members and then inducting members. We also have the additional um, burden that we haven't had before if we're still in these circumstances of inducting new members in virtual ways of working, hybrid ways of working, remote voting and, and all of that. We will try to keep that period as tight as we can um, so that the Parliament can get up and running, but it's good that we've got that bit of flexibility there on when the par Parliament first meets. In terms of oath-taking and your, your final point about social distancing, um, if we're still in those situations uh, post-election, the corporate body has expressed a real concern here about the impact of new members coming in and beginning their careers as MSPs in the circumstances that we all find ourselves in just now. Um, the corporate body's view is that it's one thing for all of you four years into a session to move to remote way ways of working, but they're very concerned about new members coming in, familiarising themselves with the building, with colleagues getting to know how the place works and having to do that either remotely or in a hybrid way. So its preference is very much for those early days to be as physical as they can in this building. So we're working on all sorts of contingencies. Corporate body has also recognised the family element to oath-taking um, and it wants us to see what we can do to prefer, pre preserve as much of that. So our planning just now is about how we could do that spread over a longer period of time, for example. Um, but their push is very much for us to be looking at 
exhausting every way that we can to have as much activity physical in this building in the days after the election as we possibly can. But obviously we need to have contingencies if we're not able to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, oh, very, very brief, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, some of these decisions impact not just on MSPs, but on MSPs staff. Uh, just very briefly, can, can you assure us that you either have consulted or will consult with MSP staff and their union reps? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, we, we, we recognise totally and there will be guidance on four members who are standing down and what we will be doing also is our HR office, HR office will be contacting each of those members individually to discuss issues regarding staff because we recognise, you know, that is a really difficult period. We'll also be directly um, we're contacting the members. Um, but yes, certainly, you know, we can, we can look to, to work with helping staff as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you both to uh, David McGill and to Hugh Williams, and um, we'll catch up with you later on, no doubt. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. So, we will be going into our fourth panel in a, in a moment or two, and uh, joining us in our final panel will be the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, and his officials Colin Brown and Ian Hockenhall, who are uh, approaching even as we speak. Um, thanks to everybody. I think it's, uh, it's been kept well to time. We do have extra work to do following this meeting, and um, it's important that uh, at the moment uh, we're following the proper guidelines and ensuring that tables and chairs are cleaned, etc., down at, uh, for the witnesses there. Um, I think everybody's handled that very well, and I thought, in particular, um, keeping things into time whilst we were online actually was quite something because that's not it's not a, an easy thing to do and everybody kept their questions and answers very very well there actually yeah okay so we'll be in the, yes jamie um could i just make a request um convener that there may be some areas that we haven't come covered in these questions because of the time constraints and that perhaps the clerks might be it might be possible for them to uh contact uh, the, the, the witnesses that we've had today to, to put those across where they haven't been covered that might be helpful. That's very sensible thanks very much for that Jamie, thank you yep and the clerks are still speaking to you so it must be okay <laughs> yes I know <laughs> okay um, right so as I say we're just about to be joined by our fourth panel this morning um, so Key questions and follow-up issues um, will be able to be asked. Uh, people do have ideas as to where they're going to be going with these. So I'm very happy with that. And I'll just give the panel four a chance to settle in there. Hi. Hi, as yeah, we were commenting on that earlier, actually. We are actually in public, but just you carry on. <laughs> so... Um, thank you very, very much indeed, um, panel. Um, you're our fourth panel this morning, and a few issues have already been developed um, from where we were speaking to our guests earlier. Um, so today, as I mentioned earlier, joining us in our final panel are the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, is Graham Day, MSP. Uh, we also have his officials, Colin Brown and Ian Hockenhall. And I won't be asking for any opening statement. Uh, we'll just move straight to questions. Give you a wee second there. And uh, the first question will come from Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning to, to panel four. Um, a lot of the questions that I've asked the other panels have focused on the issue of postal voting. So that's where I'd like to start uh, with yourselves. You'll be aware of the uh, research that was commissioned back in August that suggested what, what the level of increased uptake in postal voting might be. Uh, and we've been told that there's going to be a, an update to that research coming imminently uh, as well. But we don't really know, uh, even once we see that update, uh, what the, the demand is going to be once political parties get active campaigning and, and encouraging people to register perhaps for postal votes. We don't know what the coronavirus conditions will be uh, come spring. 
uh, from the, the government's point of view in bringing this bill forward, uh, what is your approach to that uncertainty? Uh, and what view do you take of how proactive uh, the political landscape generally ought to be in encouraging early registration for postal votes uh, up to and perhaps beyond the current projected increased uptake? OK, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. So I guess the way to look at this bill is, is there's a bits of a jigsaw. So the postal vote element is part of that. Um, and then polling day itself. And it's how, between the two approaches, we ensure that the election is conducted safely and appropriately. Um, there is a, a, a plan uh, around the turn of the year to have a public awareness campaign launched in conjunction with the Electoral Commission, um, raising awareness about the avail availability of postal votes and perhaps the advisability of people might want to think at that point. Because we want to not have a deluge of postal vote applications closer to the day of the planned poll. We obviously want to smooth that out. Um, Clearly, there is a role within that as well for uh, political parties to raise awareness. Um, I think all round there will be a general increased understanding of postal vote as an option. Um, we believe we will have the capacity, with the additional resources we've put in, to grow the postal vote as it exists now at just under 18% to 40% and perhaps beyond that in advance of of polling day. But I also recognise that there are sectors of society and individuals who have a concern about postal votes, perhaps misguided in some instances, perhaps out, purely out of ignorance. So we've been in conversation with the Electoral Commission about a, a further postal vote awareness campaign, which is about how the postal vote works, the system behind it, and about the securities that are built in. So I think all round, there is clearly, we have a plan um, to tackle this, to get to the point where there is a substantial postal vote element of an in-person uh, polling day. So let's imagine that we've, we've passed the turn of the year and you've begun your, your, your proactive um, publicity campaign around this. Uh, and say by late January, early February, the uptake of new registrations for postal votes uh, seems to be on a steeper curve than anticipated, uh, and that we might be looking toward 50% plus. Is that a point at which you begin to think, how do we plan for that extra capacity? How do we plan to get up beyond 50% uh, and perhaps further? Or is that a point at which you say, let's bring forward the deadline for registrations so that we don't get to that, that higher level of uptake, in which case there would be a significant number of people later on who get told, you're too late, you can't register for a postal vote? OK, to, to offer a degree of perspective, the turnout in the last Scottish Parliament election was circa 55%. So I think we should bear that in mind as well. Um, the existing additional resources we have provided would take us to somewhere approaching 50%, between 40 and 50%. My own view would be that if we were in the territory of it clearly being the case that more people than we'd anticipated were looking to sign up, there has to be a very early conversation with the EROs and the EMB. Uh, but we're in the business of facilitating people being able to vote. So there would have to be a positive response to that, um, because this is about encouraging people to feel able to vote. Uh, so. There is that degree of uncertainty. All of this is about contingency planning. But to offer a reassurance, what we're trying to do here is to make it easiest for people to participate in the election. OK, I, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to just see if other members want to want to come in on this, yeah. but I, I think I'll just end by expressing some continued concern uh, that, uh, you know, we, we must avoid a situation where people uh, anticipate that they'll be able to, to cast a postal vote or that their circumstances change, for example, around a requirement to self-isolate that comes in very late uh, and a normal expectation that they might still be able to register for a postal vote and be told you've missed the deadline. There would be the capacity for an individual in that situation for an emergency proxy vote if they were caught late by a scenario like the one you, that you 
point out. And do you anticipate any limits to capacity for that? Um, I'm not aware of substantial limits uh, at all. I mean, we are building in um, contingencies here. We, we're not going to get absolutely everything nailed down, but there is considerable work, and as you know, Mr Harvey, in conjunction with the other political parties uh, to get this right. And I have to say there's been a collaborative approach with the electoral um, professionals as well, which I suspect you've heard about this morning. So we're trying to, to nail down as much of this as we possibly can, but obviously we will take cognizance of the Committee's Stage 1 report as well. And, and for the record, I appreciate the opportunity there's been for cross-party discussion about this in advance. Um, the, the, the level of, of uh, self-isolation might be much lower if we're in a good place by, by the spring, but it might still be very substantial. Uh, you, you would anticipate no difficulty uh, with accommodating, for example, the current level of self-isolation in re relation to late registrations for a, an emergency proxy? We, we don't, and I should say as well that one of the things we're looking at just now is writing out to the 169,000 people who were on the shielding list, um, explaining to them the options of postal vote. Now, some or many may already be on the postal vote list, but that's another step we're looking to take to tackle the kind of things that you're alluding to. Thank you. I expect other members may want to come in, but thank yeah. you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks, Minister. Uh, Neil Finlay, please. Yeah, a turnout of 55 per cent is absolutely dismal. Absolutely dismal. And we must be doing all we can to increase that turnout. Um, uh, could I ask if the Minister would um, agree with their proposal for a free post address for um, the uh, um, electoral registration? Um, can I check? Um, we had discussions with this uh, with the electoral registration officers on this this week, and apparently it is possible to request a uh, free post uh, when you're making your application. I don't think it happens automatically, but you, you can ask, and it will be given. That's my understanding. With respect, that's not what I asked. Would you support the proposal that there's a free post address for electoral registration? To be, uh, the, the officers who were on previously said that that was a way of being much more inclusive, or being more inclusive. Um, and I think it would be far more inclusive and it would open up the opportunity for more people to take part in an election that would get us up from 55%. I'm prepared to take that away and think about it, uh, Mr Finlay, but I'm, I'm not sure that a free post address will make the difference between somebody choosing to vote and not choosing to vote. But I'm happy to take that away and think it through. The issue is cost. There will be a cost involved, but there is a cost involved in all of the measures that we have so taken. I would appreciate yeah. if you could take that away and come back to us. That would be greatly appreciated. Could I ask him... Um, uh, no, I'll come in later on another point. Sorry. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, Gil Parson, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Marlon. Uh, Master. It's in regards to proxy voting. Um, my experience is that people who use a, a postal ballot don't automatically go to proxy. Uh, there's a large number of people, and I would think it'll, it'll be exacerbated because of, if hopefully not, hopefully not, that we're in a situation where a lot more people will self-isolate, and they're the group of people who would, I would think, from my experience, would be typically people that would use the postal ballot just now, as a natural consequence, who tend to wait to the last minute and post them, and so my fear is that. If I'm right, and there's a lot more people self-isolating, and we truncate the system in some fashion and cut the time frame for them to register, because uh, because of an influx of votes, that would be counter to what we're trying to achieve. So I, I would just guard. I would ask the government and everyone involved to guard against that, and uh, not to truncate the system, to, to, to give people as much time as they possibly can and understand the complexities of uh, to make it a postal ballot secure. Uh, people are worried about that, uh, but, to, but to really make it secure and the, the systems you've got to go through to make that happen. But nevertheless, I would really, I would really plead that we don't truncate the system. So, um Mr Patterson, to, to go back to the, the early stages of looking at this, in an ideal world, I wouldn't have wanted to see the deadline 
for registration brought forward. But we're guided by the electoral professionals, and, and in this regard, in two ways. One is to try and get registration carried out as early as possible in the year, so there's not an upsurge closer to the time. And the other one is the professionals who deliver this are absolutely clear that they need this measure in place to allow them to cope with demand, and that is with considerable additional resource provided. So I recognise it seems counterintuitive to say we're encouraging people to take postal votes, but the deadline has to come forward, but I'm afraid that's the reality of the situation we're in. Is it, is it, is it not possible to do the unthinkable and have something that happened in America where there was a a, a, a date stamp on it before the, the, as long as the person posted it before the election that it could be counted rather than on the election day for receiving it as we are at the present time I'll bring in Ian who's a very detailed knowledge of how this works well, I, I suppose the, the first thing would be that we're, we're talking about the application for the post vote so they don't have to submit their post vote by the deadline that we're talking about so it's simply when they have to ask for it. So there's no change to the, the normal established processes for sending a postal vote. Um, I'd have to confess, I don't know the exact intricacies of when a postal vote has to arrive by to be counted, but I think it is very close to polling day. I don't think there's been any discussion of leeway there, but it's not an issue I'm particularly well versed on the receipt and counting of the postal vote. And let's call both, are, both are linked, are they not? Mm. No, they're not linked. Well, no. yes, but we but people would be applying for a postal vote now um, earlier on the sixth of April, uh, by yeah, the sixth of April correct. rather than the twentieth of April. So the hope would be that they'd apply and then cast the vote at a later point. But that would be as as they normally cast it uh, in any normal election. All right, follow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, and Jamie Halker Johnson, please. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good morning to the panel. Um, the Electoral Commission representative that we've just had in um, highlighted or raised concerns about the disadvantages of an all-postal ballot, and they talked about exclusion and confusion and potential disenfranchisement. So um, can I ask uh, um, uh, the Minister whether he uh, recognises and uh, accepts those, those concerns, uh, and also what, and therefore kind of what, uh, under what circumstances um, he would be looking to implement, uh, or the government might be looking to implement, a full postal voting given those concerns? Uh, a full postal ballot is an absolute last resort, and in the real world, an extremely unlikely scenario. What we, I, I reiterate, we're trying to have an in-person election with a substantial postal vote input and with the social distancing measures in place on the polling stations to conduct it safely. That power is there um, because this is a bill for contingency planning. So um, I, I would find it highly unlikely that we were in a scenario where we would be deploying that power, but it's there because we need it just in case. Thanks to the Minister for, for that. Uh, on that basis, because I mean, this is one area where I have a, a concern with the bill, um, it, you know, that puts a lot of responsibility, whether it's a you know, worst case scenario, last case um, scenario, in the power of ministers. Um, what consideration has there been given to uh, uh, more safeguards in terms of that? Because obviously it will have a huge impact potential impact on the election and represents a very difficult time in terms of what will be happening um, in the country if that, if that uh, nuclear option essentially is pressed. So what consideration has been given for more safeguards? So, for example, um, requirements for the PO not to be just consulted but to consent, um, it to be done on advice of the Electoral Commission or other bodies, and for Parliament to actually have to vote on uh, an all-postal ballot. Um so this is this if ministers were to choose to, to use this power. So there's a requirement to consult, if I remember rightly, with the chief medical officer, the presiding officer, the EMB, um, and the electoral commission. That that's there as a fact. In reality, if I was to be making that decision, I would also be looking to consult with the parties in the way we've done throughout this. I think it needs to be uh, as transparent as possible, a process that explains why that, as you described it, the nuclear option um, is pursued. Um, so I think there's a separation between what's required and what would happen in practice, and I'm more than happy to give that undertaking. Um, but I reiterate, uh, and, and, and if it were felt, for example, that ministers should produce a statement of reasons to explain how the decision was arrived at, 
um, then I, if that's a view that the committee comes to, then, then we're happy to look at that. I mean, I suppose what I would say is if, if we're, being, um, we're being required to stay on as MSPs to look at legislation that comes up and to make decisions in, again, worst-case worst scenarios, surely this w might be the kind of thing that, that um, would require parliamentary scrutiny and could require parliamentary decision-making. Because at the moment, whether it's... Um, you're talking about in practice, obviously, there would be consultation, but we're talking about, obviously, legislation here. Should that responsibility not be with Parliament to make that decision, or uh, perhaps on recommendation of ministers uh, rather than just um, ministers themselves? Um, so the, the, the approach that's been proposed in the bill is one to afford us uh, the ability to be fleet of foot, to respond quickly uh, to a situation. Uh, that's the thinking behind it. Uh, but again, I, I'm happy to take a look at what the committee um, uh, comes up with on the back of its deliberations. I don't want to say yes or no today, but I'm more than happy to consider uh, suggestions of, of that nature. Okay, thanks, Minister. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, Maureen Watt, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Morning, panel. So, you were drafting this bill before there was the possibility of vaccines being available um, within the next few months, or certainly prior to me. So, I get that you post all postal ballots is completely the result, last resort, and it's probably gone further down the line as, as, as a possibility. Yes. Hopefully, yes. We're all living in hope these days. So, if I could um, look at the actual polling day itself, clearly I would have thought that we would still be practising social distancing measures and wearing masks and things. So, um, are you actively considering extending the time of available to maybe two days of... Uh, voting, given that you know we don't, given the various variations in weather in in Scotland, we don't want long queues outside polling stations. So, are you actively considering extending the time at which people can vote in person? Because I think we've seen that, um, you know, some people now automatically vote by post, but the uptake of postal voting. Uh, is not necessarily going to be huge, and we've heard from the Electoral Commission that you know a million and a half people could be disenfranchised if we went to an all postal vote. So we can't expect most a lot more people necessarily to take up postal voting. So what are the contingencies for voting in person? Uh, so um, to pick up, follow up on what I said to to. Mr. Finlay, we're in the business of encouraging participation. Um, so in the context of voting over more than one day, there is an option for that in the bill, that, that opportunity exists there. Um, but at the same time, the electoral professionals are keen to have some certainty on whether that will be in place or not. And, and the public and the political parties would be the same. What we are currently doing is having the electoral professionals, the EROs, do a piece of modelling area by area to feed in to, a, to a, a picture for us of whether, based on what they would anticipate would be reasonable postal vote uptake, the consequences of the measures they've taken on the ground, how many polling places, the nature of through flow, the experience of the by-elections that have taken place as well, all feeds into that. Um, and essentially, if the advice that we were to receive, and this is short order advice we're seeking, that two days would be advisable, then that's something we will consider um, ahead of the bill completing its passage. Um, I would stress that, in my view, the best uh, approach, if we were to do something along those lines, is two consecutive days. There is a power in the bill to run the election over a period of days but two consecutive days, the Thursday and the Friday most likely, if that's where we needed to go. Um, but we will at all times be driven by the advice that we're getting from the people whose job it is to deliver the election. Is this not one a further argument for having voting um, at weekends over a Saturday, Sunday, rather than uh, during a weekday? 
Well, Ms. Watt, uh, there, there's always that argument advanced, but I think, as the committee may have heard today, there is also a view that because of the nature of the pandemic, pe people's normal voting patterns may be changed anyway on the day. We also have to take account of the fact that Saturdays and Sundays are religious days as well. And whilst that may not impact many of us, it will impact some people as well. And we have to take cognizance of that because as I keep saying we're not in the business of putting people off voting if we can avoid it. I think your question is a, a wider picture about the days in which we conduct elections. But I think in the context of this election, if we were to go to two days, and I don't want to say here's running here, I think the most likely uh, scenario would be the Thursday, which is the established day for poll, and a Friday. Okay, thank you. Thank you much indeed. Uh, Neil Finlay, please. You're right at the moment. Okay, no problem. We want to just hear the Aye, end. okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, Gil Parson, thank you. Is Friday, uh, Minister, not a, a, a religious day also? And I thought Thursday, Friday, sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, quite a large community. Uh, yeah, uh, Friday's a... Indeed. And I was remiss not to, put, to acknowledge that. Uh -huh. but, it, but again, if we had it over two days, the individuals caught by that would be able to vote on the Thursday. Right, uh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm fine at the minute. Uh, okay. Right, thank you that very much. One of my points. And uh, oh, John Scott, please. Thank you. Oh, thanks, um, Kandina. Um, I just wanted to go back to um, Jamie Halker Johnson's point and the issues around uh, Section 5 and the powers vested therein entirely, apparently, at the discretion of the Scottish Minister, which I think, um, in truth, gives too much powers to the Scottish Ministers as you would expect a parliamentarian to see. Um, and, and further to that, um, I mean, would you consider that a vote on Parliament should be taken on this? Now, we have the capacity to do this in a hybrid situation, um, or even, you know, we're all still going to be MSPs, even if this had to, decision had to be taken um, before we stop being MSPs. Um, uh, so that could be, we could be recalled to take such a, uh, have a debate and, and take such a decision. Uh, the Parliament should take that decision rather than Scottish ministers, because it could be argued we're, we're seeking to do so, not that I would necessarily, oh, I don't believe we would at all, but, um, you know, it could be subject to legal challenge um, um, if it was just Scottish ministers. Um, who were taking that decision, and 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 therefore I, I would suggest that uh, you know this 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 decision should perhaps be taken with the with the agreement rather than just the consultation of the presiding officer should be taken with uh, maybe even at the request of the electoral commission uh, rather than just consulting with them um, to give um, a, a little bit more. Um, uh, what's the word? A, a wider transparency to that decision being taken by Scottish ministers. So this is purely in relation to an all postal ballot. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I guess just unpack that question, which was quite detailed. I, I recognise the point about if the Parliament was coming back to vote on the decision to postpone the election. Is there then an argument for the, the Parliament to vote on a proposal to have an all-postal ballot, however unlikely that is? I, I, I recognise that argument, Mr Scott. With regard to if we remained in a situation where the government had to consult with the Electoral Commission, the presiding officer, you appreciate that the government may have to contend with a range of differing views within that context. So you would have the CMO, the Electoral Management Board, um, the, the presiding officer might have a slightly different view. The electoral commission might have a, a slightly different view. And therefore, somehow or other, ministers have to come to a decision. So um, if, if you had a um, compunction to follow the, the, the ask of the presiding officer, it might conflict with a similar compunction uh, to follow the ask of the electoral commission. I'll just put that scenario to you. Um, and as I said, on a, from, from my perspective, in a situation like that, I would want to also engage with the political parties of this parliament. So 
to go back to, to, to the answer I gave Jamie Halcrow Johnson, if this is a view that the committee holds, I will look at that, that view. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, John. Now, uh, just in the back of that, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Well, it's a different. It was a different area. Actually, it was on, on, on proxy voting. On proxy, we'll come back to you in a moment. Yeah. Then, actually, okay. Um, Gil Patterson, do you have sent? Just, just a slight deviation uh, from that. It's in regards to. Uh, again, the consecutive days, but there's also, uh, uh, and we're not talking about uh, a spread of time, uh, you know, allocating time to people, uh, different times for voting. And, you know, again, in my experience, there is a natural rhythm to an election, uh, and it, it shows up in the ballot box who votes when. Uh, workers come in the morning, uh, uh, women not just women, but mainly women taking their children to school will then vote during that period. Uh, older people, particularly retired people, will come out between 10.30 and 4.30 in daylight hours. And then at school again, more people are picking their kids up at school, and then the evening workers again. So there is actually a natural rhythm to the election that spreads the vote throughout the day, although it will peak and trough. And if, you know, I, I'm wondering how the government would manage, uh, what, what definitions would they use? Would it be age? Would it be gender? I, I, I'm not kind of clear what method they would use to kind of spread the load over two days um, rather than natural way. So at the outset, there was a discussion taking place in that space we were all in about whether if you held it over additional days, and I should say the initial thought was simply have a power for two days, and at the request of one of the other political parties, that's where the idea of um, extending that came from. But what we are envisaging, if we ended up in that space, is not to have some um, uh, dictating about who would turn up when or what group would turn up when. What we're talking about it would be to simply extend the period of the election for people to make the choice when they would turn up. Because to do otherwise would cause considerable confusion amongst the electorate, and I suspect great confusion in the polling places for those who were running them. If we were, and I keep stressing, if we were to do this, it would be simply to extend the opportunity to vote in person. With all that goes with that, and, and one of the reasons obviously to do this as soon as possible if we were to do this, is to give that ability for the returning officers to book premises. We would have to look at what we did about the security of the ballot boxes because they would have to be taken away at 10pm on the Thursday, sealed, stored somewhere safely. None of which is insurmountable in any way. But that's the kind of image, a vision we would have of how this would work. That's very clear, Minister. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jimmy. Thanks very much. Two, 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 two quick questions, if that's all right. Um, we, we talked, uh, Gil talked about um, proxy, and there have been concerns raised about what might happen if there was an outbreak within an area or um, a specific area, um, a local community, and the local polling station either was not able to be accessed or, um, or, or there was just a general feeling from people that they were in a, there was an outbreak and that they didn't want to go out. They couldn't then, obviously, get a uh, a, a postal vote, it would be too late. They wouldn't, you know, given circumstances, uh, be able to get a proxy um, um, because of the time scales on something like that. Is there any way that can be considered uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, other other ways of allowing them to vote, or do we have to accept, or does there have to be some acceptance that there will be people disenfranchised in a situation like that? Um, I think, in reality. On, a, on that kind of low level, low scale, I think that is probably where we would be. Now, that there is the capacity of any returning officer, they have contingencies for a polling station, for example. Um, the plan is for this to be a national election. We would not deploy um, an extension to the postal vote deadline for one small part of that national election. It is a national election. But let me bring you in a bit the practicalities of how we would deal with something like this anyway. Uh, there is provision to obtain a proxy vote um, reasonably close to the election and there is provision already for emergency proxies and the, the conduct order for the Scottish Parliament election, which is um, currently before 
Parliament um, has provision in relation to carers, uh, and they are getting emergency proxies as well. Okay, but that's still that, that would still be a certain time before the, there there would still be a certain limitation if you were very very close to the election and particularly a severe outbreak break broke out. Yeah, but and and there's no way that uh, because I mean I recognise what you wouldn't want is perhaps making another polling station out with that area necessarily to be available because you're wanting people to keep to keep restricted. Um, can I ask another very quick qu question, convener? Um, in terms of the kind of timetable that you're operating to and reporting back from EROs and the management board, um, you know, area, things that might trigger, circumstances that might trigger certain responses from yourself in terms of, um, you know, the need to delay that, that, that uh, delay the election, that kind of thing. Um, is that something that you've got and is that something that's going to be made public? For example, I mean, are you looking to uh, have the EROs report back in January on, on terms of or, uh, postal voting response and how does that influence you as you go uh, go along and how public will that be so obviously we're aware of how things are developing so um th these conversations are taking place on a weekly basis I, I was speaking to the electoral commission last week um we are very much proactively engaging with them so the feedback will come in if there are any concerns any anything they need to help them uh, with the election but but you you make me think there about uh, that uh, engagement, once we have got past the point of the bill completing its passage. Um, and I would be happy to commit to having some sort of formal engagement with this committee, keeping you updated, to allow you to, to, to raise any issues that you have on behalf of the Parliament, and beyond that as well. I mean, I think that would be helpful. We, you know, as MSPs, we're consistent, you know, regularly asked, What's going to happen with the election? How is it going to be impacted? And obviously, we need to be able to, to some extent, feed that information back to to our constituents. And to do that, we have to be aware of, you know, where where you think things may may be. And I think that would be that would be helpful. We have a duty to, to share that with the Parliament in the first instance. Um, and as Mr. Harvey's acknowledged from the outset, we've been very engaged with the Parliament, the parties, and the electoral commission, etc. And and I don't see that. Change. In fact, the closer we get to the election, the more important that becomes. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Neil Finlay. Yeah, um, in relation to the way in which dissolution is going to work uh, this time, it's obviously going to be the day before the election. Um, can you ex maybe cover um, issues around PERDA and um, when the government might use recall? So. Uh, use recall in what way, Mr. Finlay? The government may, there may be something happens, and we have to recall Parliament during the recess that's prior to dissolution. Well, recall uh, powers lie with the presiding officer. That's yeah, the presiding that, officer. It would say, normally yeah. be as approach, uh, you know, following an approach by the government. Well, th if there were emergency circumstances, but um, uh, quite often, if you take instances during recesses during the pandemic there have been requests from opposition parties for the presiding officer to to recall parliament um the the power to recall the parliament lies with the presiding officer with regard to purda uh, mr finley purda's purda we're in the same situation whether we go down this route or uh, as opposed to the standard run into the election the same rules would apply in the same way that the parliament is um looking to reset the provisions for MSPs and how they conduct themselves in that period, but essentially the same rules will apply in that period. So, uh, I mean, presumably if there was a recall, it would be because there's something major has happened. That would necessitate the government probably to make some announcements. Would that be in... Is there a conflict there between PERDA arrangements and the arrangements that we're going to put in this time for um, the election? Again, that is where the presiding officer would have to use his judgment on whether that contravened the, the, the purder situation that you, you uh, outline or not. But I, I think, in reality, the parliament would not be being recalled if that were to happen for anything other than very, very significant issues which I am positive that the opposition parties would want it recalled for as well. 
Um, so I don't think in a scenario like that you're looking at anything that is of a, an electoral gain nature. It's uh, the parliamentarians of the country coming together to deal with an emergency situation. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Minister. Uh, Maureen, on the back of that, please. Yes, um, I'm envisaging... So, um, we're going to be in a position... A, a, an election recess, it's being called. Um, and committees, for example, like the COVID committee, could meet if there was something um, really of, of a, a matter of urgency. But is there a situation where there might be two tiers of MSPs insofar as those MSPs who are retiring could continue their work, but those MSPs who have become candidates again um, are subject to different rules? No MSPs are MSPs, and, and the, the, the whole purpose of this is to retain the MSP status for 129 members and all, to allow them to participate in a decision or to, to postpone the election. Um, the scenario you, you paint with regard to the COVID committee, um, I think, again, would be um, quite unusual. Um, perhaps it was necessary. Uh, what, what I think we would have to be careful about, and I, don't, I personally can't see a scenario where most of the MS, MSPs are actually working during this period at all, is to ensure that there's not an advantage to individuals to be in MSPs, but also not a disadvantage, so that they are spending their time engaged in committee work, etc., to the detriment of their own um, opportunity to, to gain re-election, if, if they're seeking that. So there wouldn't be an opportunity for MSPs, for example, to ask PQs or submit motions or anything like well, that? That will be a matter for the Parliament, and I know they are working on that, but as I understand it, the, the answer to that would be no. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, that. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Just a bit of a processy question at the end. Occasionally, once in a while, uh, Ministers, when presented with amendments at stages two or three, that didn't come up uh, in a stage one inquiry will we'll use that as an argument to, uh, to bat them back and say this, this issue hasn't been raised. We're in a really truncated process with this bill. Uh, the committee's call for evidence only went out a couple of days ago. Uh, the deadline hasn't passed yet, and I, I do expect there to be submissions coming in, uh, some of which may raise issues that we haven't been able to raise today. Uh, can I just get an assurance from you that you won't be relying uh, on that argument uh, if there are issues raised in amendments that haven't come up under discussion today, that you'll take an open mind to those uh, those issues, particularly if they uh, have been suggested by, by public or, or other submissions uh, that the committee members haven't had a chance to see yet. Well, of course, that cuts both ways, Mr Harvey. Given that my door has been open since day one on this, I would be very disappointed if members who had come up with a, an amendment weren't to come and talk to me about it so we could get that early dialogue going so that we could work through if there were any unintended consequences and negative downsides to what they were possibly thinking about. You're right, we are in an expedited process and in that, that situation we are all going to have to be fleet of foot. Um, so if the question I think is would I deploy that defence um, to resist amendments, not on that basis, but I think it's really important that we think through the consequences of the bill as it's drafted, but also amendments that we think are well-intentioned and are there for a reason, but actually would have far greater negative consequences than positive ones. So it is about maintaining the approach we've had to this bill, everybody to, to work towards getting it as right as we possibly can. And I reiterate, my door is always open. I appreciate that, but there, there will be people who have expertise to bring to bear who haven't yet had a chance to put in a written submission. Uh, we, we should all take an open mind to, to anything that comes in uh, over the next wee while to, uh, to inform discussion. Even we, we, we will study the, 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 the answers to the yeah. call for written uh, evidence, obviously, and, and maintain the dialogue with whoever we need to. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> right, I'd like to... Um, Thank everyone here for their questions today. I'd like to thank the witnesses, uh, the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, and also his team, Colin Brown and Ian Hockenhall. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll 
uh, now be uh, going into private so we can chitter alone in the coldness in here. And um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>